Welcome to Sacred Realms. Huh? <laughs> Y'all are the worst. It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast. I'm your host, Lyndon Willoughby. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matt Willoughby, who's who's feeling feisty tonight. Just getting in trouble over here. I mean, I'm generally always feeling at least a little bit feisty, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's, it's a little bit extra today. It's almost the holidays, Lyndon. It, We're uh, uh, I'm just itching to be out of work. Holiday spirit is what you're is what you're putting this down to. More like uh, just ready to be done with work. But okay. Yes. Well, I don't know why you're taking that out on me, but cool. I take I'm, everything out on you. That's my job. Be, okay, I'm ready to be done with work, too. You don't see me poking at you about it, but um, I mean, yeah, you are. OK, that's fair. Maybe in my mind. Um, regardless, I'm, I'm happy to be here recording an episode of Pod with you tonight. Um, again, change of venue from what we normally do. Uh, we, we're back where it all started, Matt. We're up in the media room at mom and dad's house. <laughs> Yes, this is the one might call it the cradle of sacred realms the where <laughs> where uh, where it all came about, where it all started. And of course, the reason that we're here tonight is because this location is a uh, conveniently geolocated halfway between basically, you know, the part of town where you and I live uh, and the part of town where our guest of the evening is staying. Uh, and that guest is the one, the only, the wonder from down under, Mr. Cody Davies, who is joining us in person all the way from Australia, um, came specifically to be on this episode tonight and is turning around and leaving again tomorrow. For no other reason. For no other reason whatsoever. Cody, how you doing? yee <laughs> There you go. Uh, and you know what? The, classic. The, the, the nice thing is, I can tell you've gotten a lot of practice on that the last few days because uh, you've, uh, you know, you spent some time in uh, Central Texas. You visited San Antonio, I know, with uh, Josh, another one of our, another one of our good friends. So, um, yeah, your, your yee-haw has, yeah, I can tell you've been really practicing. Yeah, look, I have, uh, I was very excited um, this week to meet Cowboy Santa, uh, who, of course, all Texans know is the version of Santa that comes around to Texas, um, wears boots with spurs mm, and yep. a cowboy hat. Um, mm -hmm. He was standing in front of the Alamo, uh, which, of course, you remember because you're a Texan. Oh, exactly. All Texans remember yeah, the Alamo. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. As, <laughs> as far as I understand, all Texans are remembering the Alamo at all times. It's yeah. a genetic <laughs> thing. We all It's just passed down genetically. It's one of those deep, ingrained memories. Can you imagine what it would be like to forget the Alamo? Like, what I would can't. They, what what would they my, even do to us? I think I'd be dead. Yeah, like, okay. I, I think it's the only way a Texan can forget <laughs> about the Alamo. Okay. All right. Um, Cody, I mean, do you feel like you'll be remembering the Alamo at least for a, a small period of time? Like there were very memorable things in the Alamo gift shop. I have to say, good. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there were, there were little, you know, those little plushy links that you can get. Yep. Um, what if they were little plushy Davy Crockett's and you could hang them on your <laughs> Christmas tree? <laughs> Uh, if, if you could go back in time and tell uh, Senator Davy Crockett that uh, his legacy would be able to be summed up in like a like a plushy toy, then I'm not exactly sure how he would feel about that. Um, but, you know, good for him. It's folk hero. Um, as long as they I mean, do they have like the whole plushy like who's who of so, participation at the end? Like, can you get so you Davy get? Crockett is the only one who's a plushy, but there okay. are. Um, James Bowie um, gets a shirt that says that has like a big big Bowie knife on it, and it's like I'm always carrying a Bowie knife. Cool, a shirt that I'm not going to wear to the airport. No, that's I probably would a good idea. <laughs> no, don't do that. I would recommend you not. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, no, it is very exciting to to realize that Texas is just like I imagined it was. Uh, there's just cowboys everywhere. They're yeehawing <laughs> everywhere. Um, you just can't go anywhere without a without a cowboy on a horse walking past and giving you a tip of the tip of the hat. Yeah, it's crazy. I had to I had to walk by um, you know th no less than three uh, 
cowboys on horseback in order to get here tonight. So, yeah, it's just it's part of our culture, Cody, and I'm happy that you could be here and immerse mm-hmm. yourself in Did it. Did you yeah. see the cattle drive that was right across the road, Lyndon? You had to wait for the, all the cattle to cross and the cowboys to herd them across the interstate. I missed that one. Uh, well, uh, it was it was a true. Yeah, it was yeah. a true Texas experience. I'm yeah. just kidding. That didn't actually happen. Yeah, but it seems well, like something that would. Well, you know, the Alamo gift shop sounds like a great time. I just want to say I'm happy to hear that we don't have um, plushies of like uh, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana or, or anything, <laughs> like the bad guy, you know? Yeah, that's um, fair. I feel like we need a few hundred years of history more removed before he reaches like plushy status um, and it not be weird. Uh, but yeah, uh, Alamo's Alamo's great fun. Been there as well. I, um, I posed to you this question before we started recording and you gave me an answer, but just for posterity, um, would you confirm for me whether or not you bore witness to a basement at the Alamo? Oh, yes, definitely. Question mark. (laughs) (laughs) The the correct answer was no, there's no basement at the Alamo. So is this a conspiracy? Is this like where the second shooter was that shot JFK or something like that? I mean, it's a conspiracy theory, but it's rooted entirely in pop culture and it's like way, way less concerning in actual real life politics than than any of those things you just mentioned um no the the movie peewee's big adventure directed by tim burton um uh features a a notable uh side quest basically to the alamo um i forget what's exactly going on i think his bike got stolen and somebody he goes to a fortune teller who tells him that his bike is in the basement of the alamo so he goes to texas uh, to San Antonio to visit the Alamo and then ask the tour guide where the basement is. Um, and, and the tour guide says there's no basement at the Alamo. And then they all laugh at him. So, uh, yeah, there's no basement at the Alamo. Okay. Well, yeah. if they, if they were, it could be, you know, there could have been a basement at the Alamo that I didn't see, but, uh, mostly what I saw was, you know, a 200 year old church. Okay. Well, that's what the Alamo is. So there you that's, go. Good. Yeah, that's exactly the technical <laughs> definition of the Spanish missionary. Yes, yes exactly. Exactly. The Spanish mission. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Um, Cody, we are, like I said earlier, thrilled that you could be here with us in person to talk about Minish Cap. Of course, this isn't the first time that we've seen you since you've been in town. And I refuse to expound at all on why that might be. I'm just going to let that teaser lie. I'm going to let it. Uh, you know, I'm going to try and build some anticipation with my, uh, yeah, with some very nonspecific hints towards certain things. <laughs> How's that sound, Matt? It sounds pretty like you, Linda. Keep them yep. guessing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. We're announcing a line of plushies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, That's- Cody, Josh from ZU, Max Nichols. Yeah. We're, we're all going to be in plushie form for you to buy. Yeah, but they've all got voice boxes, right? And so you yank the little cord on the back and then oh, they yeah. like say things. So I think... <laughs> I think that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, you can just put Woody's voice box in mine and just say, "There's a snake in my boot." <laughs> <laughs> cool, fair enough. Yeah, I feel like we, we'll have to put a we'll have to put a disclaimer on Max's because that cord is like way longer. So you pull that, and then Max's voice box gives you like a a three hour discussion on something, right? <laughs> yeah, three and a half hours, right? <laughs> a three hour monologue with about, uh, with quotes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's well, perfect. Mine just gives Australia facts. Okay, uh, and says the water dragon. Uh, the water dragon's bad at her job. Yeah, yep. we get those. Yep, yep, one hundred percent. Cool. Uh, yeah, Sacred Realms merch line. Here you go. Starts off with plushies. Most people take the dive with t-shirts, right, or keychains or whatnot. But <laughs> we're going straight into plushies. <laughs> so, I mean, good for us. We, we're non-traditional in many ways. Here in many, in I many mean, ways. who would not want some Willoughby's on their Christmas tree? That's a good. That's a good question. Oh, man, I don't know. I yeah, think, I, think I look great as uh, on a Christmas tree. I feel like we could be like charmingly caricatured in absolutely in we could totally form. get caricatured yeah, yeah. would okay. be fun something to think about regardless uh cody uh you you have been here for a few weeks how are you enjoying your trip aside from you know san antonio you know neither here nor there san antonio is great but you've done other stuff besides just that so yeah i mean it's been a it's been a fun time in texas it's sort of been um i have criticisms about the footpath infrastructure or the sidewalks as they call them here um in that there doesn't seem to be any <laughs> no infrastructure <laughs> I mean, my my main gripe with the infrastructure is that it, it doesn't exist to not exist uh, yeah. i mean because i obviously do not have an american driver's license right and so if i'm not being driven around i'm trying to walk to places mm-hmm. but you yeah. know where i'm at it's basically there's 
a freeway just cutting like like a sword. It's cut the it's cut the the town in half. Yep, and there's no real way to like walk across there that has you know pedestrian because they didn't consider the idea that someone might walk. Sure, yeah, it's true. Yes, yes. and yeah. and so because mm-hmm. it's like it's built, it's designed around everyone being in a car at all times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is just an odd, I mean, I realize this is not America so much as this is more rural parts of it. I assume the cities are all, you know, have public transport and you would, uh, you could call it public transport. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't use that terminology. Not, not but to the extent that, you know, Europe or other places would have yeah. trains that go yeah. everywhere. Yeah. True. Some better than others. Um, the, the DFW is notoriously actually pretty behind, uh, on that metric, like, um, I, DFW does have some like inner city, uh, bus lines and like a dart train. Right. But I mean, nothing that like you, you couldn't rely on that as your sole mode of travel. Um, and it'd be very convenient for you. Like not, not the way that you could do in New York, for instance, or, you know, um, yeah, yeah, other big cities, but like, uh, yeah, we, we do have something, but yeah. And of course, uh, up where you are right now is like perpetually in the, in the grip of like, um, never ending construction. So yeah, so it, it's constant construction, but not for sidewalks. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and this is the kind of thing that I, as, as a city counselor, <laughs> when I visit other places, I'm, I'm like, what's the, what's the infrastructure investment? Like in this town, you know, what, what are they doing about, you know, walkable cities? Yeah. Uh, Uh And so I was actually discussing this a little with, well, slightly with Matt on the, on the way here is um, like Princess Zelda. She's meant to be a politician, but like who's in, in Tears of the Kingdom, who is approving the like road infrastructure? Like what, (laughs) what is the budget? Like where where, are the taxes coming from? Where are the taxes coming from? Like, (laughs) Yeah. They're still calling her Princess Zelda, even mm-hmm. though the king died in the last game. Right, spoiler. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and it, so it's like, who's is Pura, Pura the prime minister of Hyrule? Like, what's going on around here politically? Zelda's doing all of it. <laughs> Zelda is the monarch. She's the, the minister of commerce. She's the chief treasurer. Um, yeah, minister of agriculture. All of it, Zelda, 100%. So she wears many hats. Does hmm. uh, does Princess Zelda in Tears of the Kingdom? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and yeah, uh, glad definitely that you managed to notice um, in your in your time here that our expenditure on quality of life improvements for the citizens of Texas could be better. Yeah, it's yeah, I, w- I would agree they, with that statement. I mean, they're clearly spending a lot of money because where when it, wherever I went on a freeway, they were building more freeways on top of it. Like <laughs> in a perpetual <laughs> we're, we're layers double, double stack going freeways. into the sky. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. walking path, bike trail. Nope. Just and, put another freeway. And then the yeah, they've come up with new like, you know, it's a real adventure of capitalism because they've come up with a new type of road that's like, this is a toll road. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, this is faster and cleaner and neater and everything but if you're poor you can't go on it yeah exactly right so yeah <laughs> that is that, that is an accurate description of toll roads yes we're yeah. uh we're, we're we're creating some artificial stratification of the uh, of the populace right now based on income is that what you're saying I'm not here to criticize the United States of America. <laughs> well, that's okay. Matt and I can do it for a minute. We'll get a, we'll get a few one star reviews, but what the hell? You know? Nothing that hasn't happened I'm, before. I think DFW has one of the highest concentration of toll roads in the country. I think I've it's, seen that statistic somewhere. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's like up there. I mean, look, if you do get one star reviews on this for someone who's just really all about like being positive about Texas road infrastructure. No one should be positive about Texas road infrastructure. It's if you be, are, go live in Plano, Texas for a year. You will change your mind, I promise. It's going to be Schwanny Man again. It's, 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 <laughs> it's going to be another big review. It's going to be like, this is the best Zelda podcast out there. Their banter is great. Their personalities are awesome. It's exactly what I want in a Zelda podcast. Unfortunately, I have to give it one star because they don't I like just, toll roads. I can't stand their ultra polarizing conversations about <laughs> public infrastructure in the state of <laughs> Okay, cool. I'll take your one star for that, I guess. Yeah. So, Um. yeah, speaking speaking of infrastructure, uh, the Minish Cap. That's it. Oh, good segue. Hey, good segue. I was gonna try to do it, but you did. You did a good job. Yes. Uh Yeah. Minish Cap. Continue. Yeah. Look, this is a game that has infrastructure for the big people and for the little people. Yep. It, It really does. 
Um, all all equals in the Minish cap, which is great. Um, oh, thanks for doing that, Matt. Uh, yeah, and and you know it, it seems like everybody's able to get where they want to go fairly easily, right? Everything is nice and, and traversable, regardless of what size you are. So yeah, it's it really does seem like kind of a utopian travel situation in this game. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's multiple entrances. You know, I don't know if you've been wandering around the castle town, but like houses will just be like, here's the main entrance, and here's the entrance for the Minish for the Minish. Yeah, yeah you know, exactly. it's like, well, that's nice of you, especially since you haven't heard from them in hundred years. Over a century. I know, right? Yeah, yeah but <laughs> but accessibility is still a primary concern. Right? That's right. They, very important. Yeah, they they've got accessible. Yeah, very accessible buildings all over. Hyrule Castle. Too. Yeah, exactly. You put a crate in front of like the Minish door on your shop, you're going to get a nasty gram, right? A little letter. It's like, mm-hmm. excuse me, um, we we prefer that you not block the the Minish entrances and yeah. exits. We haven't seen them in a hundred years, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's just not what you do. Well, it's the sign of a jerk, right there. Because in Hyrule, instead of a minister, they have a minister for um, <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> There's the minister of commerce and then also the minister of commerce. That's right. It's like an upper and lower house situation. <laughs> which which I know all about now because that's what you and I talked about last time we shared a car together is the I'm, upper I'm and glad lower we're, house. I'm glad we're able to create fan fiction about the political structure of Hyrule. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it a two-party system or do they have something more varied and interesting? Who can tell? It's um, probably a monarchy, Lyndon. Oh, well, that's well, fair. <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> though, what the monarch does, um, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, what the what the role of Princess Zelda is, we never know. Yep, yep, no telling. Um, it could be a purely... <laughs> A purely ceremonial title that does nothing but draw <laughs> draw from the resources and economies of the country. <laughs> Why do we still have it? It's for ceremonial purposes. Um, part that, of our national that's silly. Okay, now we're attacking a country yeah, that I mean, we don't that, live in, so that, I think we should probably... No, I, there would be no country silly enough to have a political system like that. <laughs> impossible. Can't conceive of it. Oh. Well, Cody Davies, uh, notable citizen of a commonwealth country uh once again glad to have you on this episode to talk about the minish cap uh it's going to be a lot of fun last week's of course was just matt and i because that's how we typically do episode one of a new season now we're opening it up and we're going to have a larger conversation with somebody else who might have a different opinion than we do um uh, i think most assuredly you don't have the exact same opinion as matt and i do because you're your own individual person but maybe you know i i feel like this is a game that we all like a fair amount so the the conversation should be pretty positive but uh yeah um anyway so i say we go ahead and get the housekeeping out of the way and then just dive right into our discussion about minish cap chapter two unless you have some burning reason that i shouldn't do that matt nope i think we're good let's do it cool oh should we do whiskey bit real real quick first sure okay do cool whiskey bit. that sounds good all right so for uh whiskey bit this evening on this uh, on this chilly winter night uh, which it actually is it's managed to stay kind of chilly in the run-up to christmas this year that's not always a guarantee but um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but the weather's really been there for it uh anyway wait let's see where did i put the oh there it is okay for whiskey bit tonight uh we are having one of my personal favorites which is nika whiskey from the barrel um it is often incorrectly referred to as a Japanese whiskey. And the reason for that is because it is manufactured by one of the prominent um, manufacturers of Japanese whiskey, which is uh, Nikka, Nikka Distillery. Um, The reason that it cannot be accurately called a Japanese whiskey is because it is a a blended mixture of Japanese whiskeys and also scotch. Um, And Japan recently established some standards uh, which label what you can and can't refer to as being a Japanese whiskey, and it has to have a certain content of um, whiskey only from Japan, uh, which Nikka from the barrel does not meet. Uh, regardless of that, it's one of my absolute favorite whiskeys. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little scotch adjacent, honestly, it's, mm-hmm. it's a little closer to that than bourbons or rise. Um, so a little bit more in, in your end of the world, Matt, but it is a, uh, uh, 51.4% alcohol by volume whiskey, uh, which on proof wise, what is that? You just double it, right? So it's yeah. just one of 100 and what, you said it was 60? Uh, 
51. Oh, yeah, that's a 102. Yeah, cool. So uh, not too super proofy, just got a little bite to it, which is very nice. But um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I think that this has got some nice uh, Highland Scotch characteristics um, with a little bit of extra flavor from uh, Nikko whiskeys, which I do, I, I really like a lot of their <coughs> straight Japanese whiskeys. A um, little smokier than uh, bourbons, not not as sweet or spicy as a bourbon or a rye. But yeah. anyway, uh, Nikko whiskey from the barrel. It's, it's truly a great one. And it comes in such a nice looking bottle too. it's a pretty nice looking bottle yeah cheers cheers oh you didn't even pour I, it. I know i haven't poured any yet i'm, I'm drinking some coke so i didn't want to ruin the okay whiskey. well let's do the cheers coke. again and you just pretend like you took a sip yeah okay cheers mm, so good right matt it's very very scotchy it's uh i get a lot of space side off that but yeah very good oh do you really yeah, that's definitely more space side characteristic than Highland. Okay, well, you sure. know your scotch is much better than I do. Um, also, this Mark from true. the Discord corrected your pronunciation. You don't usually get phonetic correction on... Oh, I never get phonetic correction well, not on, on anything. Not on whiskey-related things. <laughs> but So, uh, anyway, uh, Mark's comment proved that you can really connect Matt... You can correct Matt's pronunciation about anything that you want. Basically, within the, yeah. the bounds of the Discord. But um, you, we've been pronouncing it Ile scotch whiskey, and, uh, and the correct pronunciation turns out is Isla. I, th- I think you got that backwards because I generally pronounce it Elay. No, I, well, that's and, what he I, said. On. He said you've been saying it wrong. All right. I'm going to look again and we're going to get this right. So let me see. OK, there's probably a video for this or something How to pronounce. How to pronounce this word. Here you go, Matt. Isla. Yeah, Isla. Uh, yeah. OK. Isla. Isla. Interesting. Isla. See, I've heard heard literally every possible way that I've pronounced it. I've been corrected by one person or more. So I just I think there's no right way to do it. You Ladies do and it. gentlemen, we've just had an interloper step into the recording studio. Uh, not that this is going to be. Isla or Ile. No, you, you said Ile for like five years. That's what we were talking. So wrong, it's, it's, hold, it's hold on, hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, notable third uh, brother in the Willoughby Triforce, Jackson, just joined us in the room. Uh, he's he's wrecking our pod right now, but we're having a discussion that's very much up his alley. So I was just talking about, so you know the whole bit where Matt gets his pronunciation of, of just things generally corrected all the time by people on the Discord? Pretty constantly. Yeah, okay, cool. So anyway, uh, one of our listeners from Scotland uh, ju- uh, jumped in a few days ago to let Matt know that he'd been pronouncing Isla incorrectly every time we've mentioned it on the show, right? Been saying Ile, but, uh, you know, hopped into... Yeah, well, it's not like someone from that country would know what that island is called. No, there's no way. So anyway, but- like I said, I've been corrected both ways that I've said it. So I look. Well, it's, now, it's an, a, now an actual Scotsman has told you. Yeah, so. and I, I agree. It's Isla. Okay, there we go. Yes, that's that's what he said. Thanks. Isla. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would also be ashamed of me because uh, I want. I a couple weeks ago we were talking about bourbon and the mash bill, and I said it had to be at least fifty one percent rye and i meant corn i meant corn but i said rye because it was a oh, high no. rye who called national. you out on it uh Rebenak actually was like hey you said you said rye i know you meant corn but you said rye and i was like damn it <laughs> see we've got we've got people who actually do listen to this show <laughs> hey jackson you want to get in here and say hi real quick before you uh, sit the rest of the episode out yes hello people i hope you're having fun i can't wait to join on a later episode this is minica in a minish cap right yes. yeah this is uh chapter two so you're gonna be on chapter not four n- not chapter three but the one after that so. yeah we'll be recording in the cold weather yeah it's gonna be great so can't can't wait to uh can't wait to do that for sure jackson's been asking me when we're gonna play minish cap for a very long time because he loves this game so yay it was one of my first so. all right catch you later jackson bye Man, whiskey bit is always better when the whiskey maestro of our family hops in. To <laughs> is say actually a word. here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So cool, cool. All right. Let's go do the housekeeping now. Jackson kind of threw that whole thing off the rails for us, but <laughs> we, we digress. That's okay. We love him very much. All right, y'all. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly re-examination of the Legend of Zelda, one little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week we play a new section of a Zelda game, and then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. 
If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts. Hit that subscribe button. Be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. If you want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod to get access to our Discord channel, listener mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Additionally, one of the benefits that Master Sword patrons and above get is that we read their names every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are Brandon, Shryquill, Joseph, Nick Tendo, Adam, Sakura Sky, Art, Jeremy, Dante, Two, Tom, Andy, Billy, Connor, Rachel, Shepherd Street, Matthew, Chris, Daniel, Fallout 907, Kelso, Chris, Tiffany the Star, Daxel, Patrice, Stephanie, Dark Nuck, Il Maestro himself, who's working on a new album. Really excited for that. Coming out January 10th. Oh, is that when? Yes. Oh, I can't wait. All right. Uh, Brian, George, Mike, Dylan, Lennon, Kolku, Aiden, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Gep, Brittany, Davey, Haru the Mighty, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Low Life Lopez, Ben, Daniel, Nick D underscore TV, High Rule Interviews, a.k.a. Maximum Nichols, Garrett, and Drew. These are the most legendary of individuals, and I would climb a mountainside and hang out in a uh, in a mountain spring full of mineral water uh, with any of them any day of the week. Absolutely, yes. That sounds like a good time. Yep, 100%. At least you that. didn't say anything about going into a lava-filled dungeon. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, these hot springs look cozy. It's they do. They look pretty cool. Kind of what I'm saying. Green so. water is a little weird. But I think I could think I could get over it. I wonder if we're going to a hot spring in Colorado this year. I uh, hope so. Uh, you know what? That doesn't. I don't know if that would be Nuggy. That's probably friendly. not Nuggy friendly. Okay. No. Cool. Yeah. Shame. Well. Anyway. One day. All right, y'all. But without further ado, let's talk about what we played. We do that every week in the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is a six-part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel. Today, we are covering the Minish Cap Chapter Two, Part One of the Sacred Realms Rundown. Is as always the plot recap this week, read by Matt. Take it away, Matt. As we leave the Deepwood Shrine, we make the short trek back to the Minish village in the woods, hoping that the Minish elder can assist us with the next step of our journey. Sure enough, the elder is true to his word and has the answers we need. Our next element is in the mountain range to the northwest upon Mount Cronell. Also, a tribe of mountain-dwelling Minish live near the peaks, and their chief, Malari, who is the only Minish capable of repairing the Sacred Blade. After the Elder promises to send word to Malari, alerting him of our need, he opens a side passage to allow us access to a new section of the Minish Woods to expedite our journey to the west. As we exit to the west of the village, we see a stump which can transform us back to our normal size, as well as a lone Minas house made out of a mushroom. Before we regrow, we stop into the house to see what this lone Minish might have to say. It turns out that our deeds in the Deepwood Shrine are already well known, and the Minish knows who we are at once. He introduces himself as Bellari, a researcher of antiquities and amateur inventor. He gives us a bomb bag filled with explosive bombs in order to help us clear the debris between here and the town and sends us on our way. After regrowing to our normal size, we make our way out of the Minish woods, using our handy new bombs to blow some debris out of the way. The rest of Hyrule is still full of the monsters that Vati let loose, but we have some more experience in handling them now, so we have no difficulty making it up to Hyrule Castle Town. Luckily, most of the damage on the south end of town seems to be repaired, and in fact, much of the town seems to have resumed normal activity. As soon as we enter, we see a strange man in extravagant bright blue clothes and a tall top hat, leading a procession of young children. As this odd figure plays a music box he's carrying, he proclaims the virtues of something called kinstones to anyone in earshot. As the odd processional comes to a stop in front of us, we are forced to admit to the man that we have absolutely no idea what kinstones are. He decides that we need a free kinstone bag for ourselves and holds a demonstration on how to fuse them together. As the two pieces of the man's kinstones come together, they magically fuse themselves and then race off into the sky as a streak of light. He tells us that elsewhere in the land, something good has happened, and we take his word for it as the processional continues their way around town. We leave the entryway where we were ambushed by the Kinstone Man and head to the west exit of the town that leads to Mount Cornell. 
The guard stationed there won't allow us to pass, even though we carry a sword and shield, saying that the area is too dangerous and we need to learn some advanced sword skills before we can proceed. He directs us to the sword school in the south of town, where Swiftblade teaches advanced sword techniques. When we arrive at the dojo, Swiftblade promises to do just that, and we agree to train with him. The first move he teaches us is the spin attack, which allows us to build up energy in the blade and unleash it in a spinning motion that will destroy enemies all around us. After some weird psychic possession and a lot of shouting, we prove to Swiftblade that we can use the spin attack at will and leave the dojo. After we demonstrate our new move to the guard, he allows us to pass and we enter the foothills of the mountains of Hyrule. Unlike the rolling hills, open fields, and occasional woodland areas we are used to from childhood, the foothills and mountains are steep, rock-strewn, and dotted with odd green water coming up from the ground. The air around is hot, sticky, and smelly from the natural spring water. The monsters that Vati unleashed are just as prevalent here as anywhere else, but they are new variants from the ones on the plains and forests. Hopping tektites, steel-masked helmosaurs, and knife-wielding ketons roam the areas leading to the peaks of the mountain. We find a cave with a Deku scrub in it, and after reflecting a Deku nut back at him, he agrees to sell us an empty bottle. He also tells us that his brother is further to the west in the highlands, and that if we want to climb to the mountain, he will have something useful for us. As we climb the mountain path, avoiding the falling rocks and slashing away at the enemies in our path, we see more minish portals around. Unlike the ones in the woods, these look like large stones with cracks in the center, but they work just the same. By utilizing the stones, we can move around magical beanstalks to places where we need the long, tall, strong vines to form paths. The green middle mineral water is ever-present on the lower levels of the mountain, and by using it on some immature bean sprout seedlings, we can force them to grow big and tall right before our eyes. Multiple times we find ourselves stuck on an impassable ledge. But at one of these ledges, we see a swirling gust of wind in front of us. Eslo tells us to jump into the wind with an exclamation about hoping this works, and as we pass through the gust, he inflates to a huge size, allowing us to glide through the air to a nearby path. Even with all these tricks, the path up the mountain is treacherous, but we do find a few helpful treasures, including the Grip Ring, which is sold by the Deku Scrub in the Highlands. The ring allows us to free climb the rocky walls of the mountain and makes the rest of the trip upwards a slight easier. Along the way, we also find a fairy fountain, and when we prove to the fairy that we aren't selfish by refusing her gift of silver or gold, she rewards us with a larger bomb bag that can carry up to 30 bombs. Finally, we reach the top of the mountain and find that the entire area is a long abandoned mine. Many of the mine shafts have become infested with red chews and a new form of chew that can turn into a solid spiked ball when threatened. But we do find the elusive tribe of mountain-dwelling Minish up here, in their own mine that is built into the side of the abandoned human mine. The mountain Minish look very dissimilar to their wood-dwelling cousins, with large beards or mustaches, large bodies, and a tendency to sing little ditties while they use their pickaxes to break away the stone in their path. We find Malari, the master smith, near the bottom of the mine, talking to some of his apprentices around a wooden table. Just as with Balari the inventor, Malari knows who we are based on the clothes we're wearing and the note that the Minish elder sent ahead of us. He's a huge Minish with a gloriously large mustache whose ends reach down to his broad chest. Like all the other mountain Minish, he has long blonde hair and is dressed in blue and red clothing. The Master Smith is a jolly type of fellow who's eager to help with all this adventure, what with the rescuing of princesses and such. He says that he would be happy to reforge the sword for us, but will need the power of the four elements to complete the sword and turn it into a real sacred blade. He tells us to leave the broken pieces of the Pecori blade with him while we go to the mines in search of the element of fire, and his apprentices and he get to work on the lengthy process of reforging the sword. As we leave Malari's mind with the thunderous sound of hammer against steel, we head just north to the very top of the mountain and find the Cave of Flames. 
The cave is a further extension of the mines that were dug into the mountain, but these tunnels have been abandoned for so long that they have fallen into severe disrepair. The air is blisteringly hot and smells of sulfur and ash, and Ezlo is eager to leave as soon as we step foot in the area. We start diving into the cave and immediately run into some new enemies in the form of walking bombs that start sprinting around maniacally as soon as we hit them with a sword. In the very next room are two large turtles with blue spiked shells that we have to flip over onto their back before we can deal any damage to them. Luckily, using our shield to stop their attacks causes them to go end over end, and in reward for destroying the two monsters, we find the compass. Based on just these first two rooms, we can tell that we're in for a slog through a gauntlet of monsters to find the element hidden away here. The lower floors of the mine are definitely filled with monsters, but also loads of obstacles that have blocked the path forward as the mine has fallen deeper into disrepair over the years. Among the more unique things that we find as we explore is a minecart and some tracks that lead to seemingly random rooms. With some experimentation, we figure out how to operate the minecart and direct it to different areas of the mine, which proves to be a truly harrowing experience for both us and Ezlo. The oddness of the mine's infrastructure continues as we find minish portals and minish sized doors scattered around, which allow access to otherwise inaccessible areas of the mine. One of these areas is a lava and fire filled room that threatens to singe Ezlo's threads. The dungeon map is in a chest here, and then we use the gust jar to extinguish the flames and move across the unstable rocks to pass over the lava field and further into the cave. As we keep making our way further and further into the bowels of the mountain, we find more and more of the mine filled with lava, fire, and gigantic roly-poly enemies that are extremely useful for filling in holes that have formed in the ground. Some more wind gusts allow us to glide like a hot air balloon over the lava fields, and eventually we find ourselves out of the lava chambers at last. In an inner room of the mine, we are ambushed by a dozen of the spiked gray chews, which can only be destroyed by blowing them to bits with bombs. But after we destroy all of them, we're awarded with the cane of Pachi, which can magically flip things upside down. While this doesn't sound overly useful in and of itself, we realize that it can also help us vault out of holes in the ground to get much higher into the air and over obstacles more easily. As we continue through the fiery cavern, we use the cane to flip over some rocks that are blocking our path, invert some more blue shell turtles, get minecarts right side up, and leap over numerous obstacles. The final bottom floor of the mine is another lava-filled cavern that we have to traverse extremely cautiously, with the combination of moving unstable rock, rock platforms, fire-strewn ledges, and more gusts of wind that allow us to float over sections of the lava pond. Finally, we claim the big key and make our way to the door that contains the boss and head inside to see what monster guards the element of fire. The room behind the door contains some pots and a huge hole in the floor, leading to the furthest sublevel of the mines. We drop down the hole and find ourselves in a square room with a small lake of lava in the center. Out of this magma rises a creature that looks like a cross between a dragon and a rock turtle, with white, scaly armor on its head and a huge glowing chunk of rock for a shell protecting its back. Glee Rock roars its anger at our disturbance of its slumber and begins to spew fire around the arena in retribution. The fight is immediately hectic and dangerous as we avoid the fire that the dragon spits at us while also staying well clear of the lava in the center. We maneuver around the beast, trying to get a, a clear picture of how to damage it from so far away. Until we see the glowing crystal structure that the rock shell is protecting. We move around to the side of Glee Rock and hit its shell with the cane of Pachi, causing the rock to invert and smash into the dragon's back with great force. The dragon is stunned and its head falls to the shore, allowing us to use its long neck as a bridge to its back and slash away at the exposed crystal. After a few slashes, the dragon regains its senses, and we have to leap to shore before Glee Rock submerges itself below the surface of the lava. As we hit the shore, the entire cavern begins to shake and the rocks start falling from the ceiling. 
Also, it seems Glirok is forcing more and more lava into the arena, as the lava begins to inch ever closer to the walls, shrinking the shore to a small strip of ground barely wider than we are. Eventually, the lava and the rock slides subside, and Glirok bursts forth once more, spewing fire over a full quarter of the ground around us. We continue as we were, trying to get a shot at the rock on his back, but Glirok is moving faster and faster, and we now have to... We now have the fire to contend with as well. But eventually we succeed in stunning it once more and get another round of slashes on the exposed crystal. Glirok proves to be a resilient foe, and it takes two more rounds of stunning and slashing before the monster is destroyed. As the dragon explodes from head to tail, the lava in the cavern magically solidifies and cools into rock and we know that the Cave of Flames has reverted to a decrepit yet harmless mine once more. The element of fire descends to us from the ceiling of the cavern, and the heat it radiates is not dangerous or harmful like the lava of the cavern. Instead, it is the life-giving and comforting heat of a hearth fire. The element is invigorating and filled with power to overcome any darkness. We collect the heart container that Glirok dropped and quickly step into the portal that will take us back into the cool mountain air. With two of the four elements collected, we begin to feel hopeful about our quest, and we can feel our own power growing as we continue to collect the magical fuel for the Sacred Blade. Hopefully soon we will be able to break the curse on Zelda and restore the Kingdom of Hyrule to peace once more. Well done, as always, Matt. That brings us to part two, which is our takes where we talk about this section of the game and how it made us feel. And before we get into the body of that discussion, we're going to do that thing with Cody, because this is his first appearance on this season of the show, where we get your history with the Minish Cap and your general thoughts on the game going into this playthrough. Um, and then we'll probably <coughs> talk about your thoughts and feelings of uh, the stuff that we covered last week as well. So, uh, yeah, go for it, Cody. Tell us about your history with the Minish Cap. Um, I mean, I don't have too deep of a history with it. I mean, I, it came out, I got it, I played it, I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, but it wasn't one that... Fair. I guess my history with it is, I think it's a good Zelda game, but it's not necessarily one that I have a emotional attachment to. Okay. You know? um, in the same way that I do for a lot of the 3D yeah. games. Now, were you... Um, were you working with Zelda Universe or, or doing any kind of actual coverage of Minish Cap at the time that that game came out, or does that proceed? Um, I was on... I had joined the Zelda Universe forums by then. Um, so I joined the Zelda Universe forums in 2003, so my forum account is uh, coming on 20 years old. Nice. Uh, nice. And... Uh, but I didn't, I didn't start volunteering at Zelda Universe until 2007, which was... A, just post Twilight Princess. Mm -hmm. um, so we, yeah, the, the games that I sort of started covering were um, like Phantom Hourglass, Spirit Track, Skyward Sword. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So definitely, you know, playing this one more as a, a fan than anything else when it came out. Um, you said that this is one that you have always considered to be a good Zelda game, but not one that you have a lot of emotional attachment to. Um what what do you think were some of the reasons that that is the case? Like, is it just, um, you know, like a lot of good experiences to be had, but but nothing that, I don't know, nothing that really grabbed you necessarily as much as, as some titles that came after or? Um, I don't know. I think it's just a, I don't think it's so much to do with the game. Like, if I had been five years younger when it came out or something, maybe that would have been what I'd attached. Because I, I got really attached to the Oracle games, actually, yeah, uh, which were the generation before it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think, better than the Oracle games in a lot of ways. But um, it's also, I guess, just, I don't know, it's a smooth game. I think A Link Between Worlds might be a comparison that I might make. Like, it's a game that is, it's not doing, trying to do major innovations, mm -hmm. But it is very smoothly doing Zelda. Yeah. And it's like, it's always, it's something that I'd, I'd recommend to anyone because it's like, here's a smooth Zelda experience. 
Um, but, you know, I guess I just never, it never clicked for me as like, you know, one of my favorite games of all time or anything like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that is, those are terms that a lot of people, I think, probably agree upon when we're talking about this game. Um, I know that a lot of our guests that we've had on before this, you know, this game's come up once or twice and a lot of people do tend to really have appreciation for it, but it never really seems like it's in anybody's top three, top five, anything like that, that we've talked to so far. Um, and I, I think the comparison to a link between worlds is a really apt one, right? Uh, because it is doing like, obviously, um, you know, there's some things that A Link Between Worlds is doing that were pushing the envelope a bit more for Zelda, especially for top down Zelda. Um, but it still was just at the end of the day, a very competent, very smooth feeling like, yep, this is this is Zelda. You know, this is the same flavor of Zelda that we've been getting in top down experiences basically since the beginning, at the very least since A Link to the Past. Um, and Minish Cap is doing a very similar thing, right? Um, where, you know, we're, we're getting a, a prettier package, you know, um, there's more graphical and, you know, audio fidelity that's kind of helping immerse us in the world a little bit more, but from just a mechanical standpoint and from like a moment to moment gameplay situation, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty standard feeling, honestly, um, which sounds like a knock, but isn't actually, um, so that, that mm. makes total sense. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, you know, obviously it's a Capcom um Zelda game um which makes it different from what well, aside from the oracles which were also done by Capcom yeah any other Zelda game outside of like CDI and stuff is yeah Nintendo first party stuff exactly um and I think for them to create a very good very competent Zelda game mm -hmm. is great like it's you know yeah, it's what I. It's a Zelda game that I'd recommend to anyone as a Zelda game. Well, especially now that like you recommending this game to a person, it, like if it's somebody that owns a Nintendo Switch, you know that they could reliably play it, right? Yeah. So um, definitely not something that you could have uh, made much of a case for um, even uh, six nine months ago. How long has this been on the? When did it drop? <laughs> Um, relatively recently they introduced the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you haven't gotten it, because this is, this is not in the regular Nintendo Switch Online membership. It's like the higher tier one that allows access to the Nintendo 64 and the Game Boy Advance. Um. And the Mario Kart DLC. And right? the Mario Kart DLC yeah. and, and a couple of other things like some Animal Crossing DLC or something, I think. Yeah. Um. But, you know, so if you only have that basic tier, I think, you know, it's probably if you like Zelda games, the Nintendo 64 obviously has two of the greatest of all time sitting mm -hmm. on there. And there's another one in the Minish Cap. And the Game Boy Advance honestly has a bunch of good games that I've I've put on my backlog of like, oh, I want to play the Fire Emblem for the Game Boy Advance because mm -hmm. that's on there now. And I want to play uh, through the Mario and Luigi game. And it's like the Game Boy Advance was just such a good console with so much on it. Yeah. Uh, Metroid Fusion is the big one for me. I've mm. never played that game and because I was never really a Metroid person. Um, and then Metroid Dread just grabbed me in a real big way when it came out. So, um, you know, definitely want to go back and, and get that one, especially now that I kind of like understand the story, you know, mm -hmm. um, of, of the Metroid series or at least of the 2D of the non prime games, because no one really knows how those fit in. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a it's it's a fantastic deal. So, um, yeah, if you've got a switch and you're on the fence about it, then I highly recommend going for it. But I mean, the Game Boy Advance SP era had some of the most formative uh, cartridge games like that of our lives. Yeah. Like it was around the time where we were really getting into that. And like Lyndon and I, we were doing it in the car. Most of the time uh, we we're playing them in the car. Most of the time, like on yep. road trips or yep. just on the way to school, you could throw it in your backpack when you got to school and then sneak it out and try to try to play some at, you yeah. know, recess or something. Well, and we, like, we had a big conversation last week about 16 bit graphics. Right. Um, and the differences, you know, between that and eight bit titles and um, about how within the Zelda series, we only get two entries that are 16 bit. We've got a link to the past and then Minish Cap. Um, but I, I think that, you know, one thing that we didn't explicitly say last week, but that was kind of we skirted around this point is just how timeless games of that 
style tend to feel mm-hmm. right. Um, yeah. They, I think they tend to uh, hold their aesthetic appeal longer. Um, I, I think the Game Boy Advance is, I don't know, almost like the Super Nintendo in its sort of timeless appeal. Like, because Nintendo 64, I love it, but it really translates badly to big screen mm-hmm. TVs and all all this modern stuff. Like, you see all these, the, you see all the moving parts in it in a way that you didn't back then. It looks muddy and yeah. all that kind of thing. But the Game Boy Advance, it just all still... All still looks really good. Yep. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, I know you don't keep a like a firm ranking the way that Josh does, but um, if you had to say roughly where Minish Cap would fall, if you did have such a thing where it would be kind of toward the bottom, in the middle somewhere. It's in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, just, I mean, it's below the 3D Zeldas um, mm-hmm. for me because I'm I'm a big 3D Zelda person. Sure. Um and it's below probably Link's Awakening and like a link between worlds for me. Okay. Um, but it's probably above all the other 2D and top down mm-hmm. games for me. Um, I think, and it's one that, oh, in terms of what you were saying about when it released, there was one thing going for it that made it a bit unique when it released is it was briefly the start of the timeline. Oh right, because this was a pre Skyward Sword. Because this yeah. was a, this was before Ocarina of Time, but there was still there was still like six or seven years to go until Skyward Sword yeah. released, mm-hmm. and so it it sort of took. And Skyward Sword is when the Hyrule Historia came out too, so this wasn't officially confirmed until the Hyrule Historia. But people were going, "Look, this is you know the a big refrain you'd hear is, well, this is where Link got his hat." Mm-hmm. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes right. sense. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, the, the hat, the hat link theory, mm-hmm. uh, was there. And then there was, there's some minor world building stuff. It's not really a spoiler or anything. It's just sort of like talking about like, well, the reason you find rupees in pots and all this kind of thing, the minish are like a back story. Oh, <laughs> they're putting <laughs> the money in the pots. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I like that. That's fun. I never even picked up on that. Um, but that's fun headcanon for sure. I wonder, it does make me wonder, like in a world where Skyward Sword didn't immediately come out, you know, pretty soon after this and establish more firmly, like what the beginning of the timeline is. It, it makes me wonder if the intention was to maybe have this whole suite of Zelda games that were more like, le, you know, less focused on Ganon and the Master Sword and the Triforce and stuff and more about just like what was going on in not not prehistoric high rule, but in more ancient high rule, you know, um, that idea I think is very intriguing and obviously is just sort of a, a fun musing now because like that's not how things turned out. But um, yeah, I, I, I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but um, I think that the whole story of the Minish and the history that's presented at the beginning of this game is just so interesting. And I'm curious to hear your take on it because it's like it's so aside from everything else that is of concern in the mainline Zelda series for the most part. Right. Um, and it, it's just, it's telling a very different kind of story and it doesn't seem at all concerned with, you know, like, well, talking about the master sword and you know, like, it's not present in this game at all. Like big pillars are just not here. Um, is that something that you appreciate? Yeah. I mean, to be, to be fair, it's, it's not, unusual for the Zelda series like it it wasn't a relatively recent thing because obviously if we look at the Zelda games Zelda 2 Ganon was only there if you died which you did a lot but and it was right. a, it's a return of Ganon a lot yes uh, but theoretically in a uh, in a deathless run um there is no Ganon in that game Link's Awakening is not a Ganon game Majora's Mask is not a Ganon game. That's basically the second game, the fourth game, the sixth game, no Ganon. That's that's all fair. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it was it was a bit of a tradition, um, you know, to some extent to, uh, you know, to have side adventures that weren't Ganon. Ganon didn't have to be in every game. Ganon was, well, basically in every other game. Um, and, you know, I think that's fine. I think the... When I when I like Ganon the least is when um, 
as you may have seen in the last season of Pod, is when they stick him in uh, <laughs> <laughs> randomly for, for at the no end. reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I much prefer to have yeah, just an interesting little little guy like Vardy. You would uh, you would rather have no Ganon than have random Ganon. Is yeah. What I'm yeah. Okay. <laughs> random Ganon. Okay. That, that makes sense. I think I agree with it. Um, yeah. It is funny too because I I wonder if there was a point where there was maybe somebody thinking like, well, we should we try to make it to where the sword in this game like ends up becoming the master sword later? Or do we want to keep those things separate? Right. Um, and I'm glad they kept them separate. Cause it's like, yeah, you can have more than one legendary sword, you know, why not? Oh yeah. I mean, there's a few legendary swords run, running around. Like there's, there's a few, uh, there's a few re- repeats throughout the history of, you know, dark worlds. There's, a, there's about four or five of them hanging sure. around now, yeah, yeah. you know, um, s- magical swords, <laughs> Like, Sky civilizations. Sky yeah. civilizations. The Master Sword, like, well, obviously, Zelda 1, no Master Sword. Zelda 2, no Master Sword. Link's Awakening, no Master Sword. Um, Majora's Mask, no Master Sword. So, again, same thing as the No Ganons. Like, some of these things that we say, these are core pillars of what a Zelda game is. You can have a game that's like Link's Awakening, which is where on your list? Like, fours or something? Uh, I think Link's Awakening. Well, here, you know what? I, I keep it easily accessible. Uh, Link's Awakening is, is currently number five. Number five. And that's a game with, yeah, without a Ganon, without a Master Sword, mm-hmm. um, without a bunch of these pillars of, it's not even, it's not in Hyrule. And yet, you know. Yeah. None of these pillars are there, and yet you say, "Oh, that's a great Zelda game." And I do think one of one of the reasons I think that's that's kind of it right there, Cody, is one of the reasons that it does become such a talking point here is because most of those other games take place in not Hyrule, right? Mm-hmm. But here we're we're in Hyrule. We've got the familiar trappings, the familiar characters, right? Or at least a lot of them. But you know, also not you know not ganon not master sword um even a lot of these locations right you know they've like they we know they're in hyrule and we can kind of try to headcanon our way into being like well is the is minish woods the pharaon woods the lost woods it like is mount cornell death mountain all these things right um because we're just trying to find those similarities because we know that like technically it is in the same place, but it's like, are they the same spots? Maybe, maybe not. We just don't know. It's a, it's a fun story of um, a lot of things feeling very similar, but also a lot of things feeling very different, especially when you consider that most incarnations of Hyrule tend to have some major commonalities, right? We talked about this in the breath of the wild season, but like, if you look at the overworld maps of most incarnations of Hyrule, there are some things that are pretty much in alignment most of the time. Right. right. Well, they're not alignment in the sense that they're in the same place, but mm-hmm. uh, they're in alignment in the sense there's always a mountain, there's always a lake. Right. But a lot, like even a lot of times they are in the same place, right? Like if you look, I was doing this the other day, I was looking at the map of Twilight Princess, Breath of the Wild, A Link to the Past, um, a Lego Tomb Worlds doesn't count, right? But um, anyway, and like if you lay them all on top of each other, you do start to notice a lot of similarities, right? Like Hyrule Castle kind of being in the middle, Death Mountain's kind of up here, you know, Lake Hylia is usually kind of down here somewhere, right? Desert's usually down in this corner. And some things obviously move around, right? Like Twilight Princess has a, a few of those, actually. But there tend to be some commonalities, um, even like within the differences, you know, and Minish Cap does not have that going on. Like it is very, very different. Very different. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, which, which I think is a fine thing just to be super clear about, but anyway, um, cool. Well, thanks for catching us up on some of your initial thoughts and musings and kind of your history with the game, Cody. Let's go ahead and start talking about this specific section of Minish Cap, um, which is of course, uh, the area after we've cleared the deep wood shrine. Um, the mission that we have now is that we've got to go find a master smith in uh mount cornell and we've got to fix the picori blade so um matt i'm gonna let you go first how did how did you feel about this section of the game just generally speaking yeah i i really like i really liked it i cody and i talked a little bit about it uh on the way here tonight is that this is kind of a return to form of uh after your first dungeon just like go anywhere that you anywhere that you can access go and just do whatever you want and see what there is to do and you know maybe try a mini game or buy a big wallet because why not like you just can mm-hmm. and um 
talk to everybody, learn about kinstones, learn about, uh, you know, whatever. Get some bombs from a random minish in a mushroom for no reason. Like, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. stuff like that. It's it's just a very return to, like, yay, go and do form of game. And I, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed exploring Hyrule. I spent a lot of time in Castletown talking to everybody and, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And it actually took me a little bit of to figure out what to do and where to go and how to get out of there. And, um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think that, I think that's correct. I think that Minish Cap is doing an interesting thing where obviously the top down Zelda games, um, they tend to have kind of what, what we would refer to as a Metroidvania, um, approach where, get new item, get access to a new area of the map is kind of the way that it works, right? And Minish Cap keeps things just a little bit more segmented than some do. Um, To me, it feels most similar to Link's Awakening, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Link's Awakening, especially until you've cleared the second dungeon, um, and then the fourth one after that when you get the flippers, uh, but Link's Awakening keeps things pretty pretty segmented, um, and you really can't, you can't, unlock most of Koholan Island right off the bat. Like you do need access to certain items and you're, otherwise you're just not going anywhere. Um, you know, a link to the past, a link between worlds, those games, you've got a bit more freedom to roam mostly just because the early game segments typically take place in the very center of the map, right around Hyrule castle. So typically in those games, you know, you can, you can go all the way over to the, to the, um, Eastern Palace area. You can go to Kakariko Village. You can uh, you can kind of like try and walk up towards the mountains. You know, mm-hmm. you can go all the mm-hmm. way to the south. Like uh, so, those games do have like there's still a lot of Metroidvania. Like yeah, until you get the hook shot, you can't make it to the other side of the mountains or whatever. You know, but um, you can get around a little bit more. Minish Cap is keeping things a little bit more locked down, right? Mm. Um, you can get back to Castletown, which is great, and you can explore everywhere that you had visited on your way to the Minish Woods. Um, but the, the it really keeps you from going off towards other areas of the map where other dungeons are, right? Like you can see very clear blockers that are just like, oh, yep, that's, yep, need, need an item to get in and do that, right? Or the guards won't let you through certain areas. Yeah, too. that's like, the other yeah. one. Yeah, Yeah, there's a mix between the Metroidvania style and also just the, whoops, we're doing construction here, Uh, come back later. (laughs) Right. You know? the This shop isn't open or this... Something that's much more explicitly like, oh, this is being time-gated from you. Yeah. 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 Uh, But it is, the hub has a lot there. Like, I guess I was surprised going back in and just the number of people in the -hmm. the castle town that had unique... Things going because all those people. I mean, when you get into the kinstone trading and everything, you can, you know, you can activate that with them, and it will give you a little bio. Like they've all got a name, they've all got a a description. There's yeah. there's a whole bunch of shops and things in town. It is a sort of a bigger a bigger hub a bigger hub location than you see in most. Um, I I don't know. Is there a, is there a bigger two D hub location? In- um. No, actually, I don't think so. This is definitely, I, I don't know if it's bigger just by, what, actually, yeah, I think it is. It's bigger than Mabe Village, for sure. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's bigger than Kakariko Village in A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds. And even if it's not bigger just in terms of, like, grid spaces than than that, there's certainly a lot more going on yeah. here. So, um, yeah, it definitely it definitely feels uh, pretty massive, and I, I like the hustle and bustle that's kind of going on in the town. It really does feel like a lived in place. Mm. Um, people kind of going about their daily business, and it's great because obviously we saw a very active version of the town in the first chapter, right? Because we went for the festival, and there were a lot of things going on that were just scenery for that event, right? Um, but here we're seeing it more in just like okay, this is what Castle Town looks like during general gameplay, and it's honestly not too too. Different different um than how it looked during festival time uh and and yeah i I definitely really like exploring this version of hyrule castle and i I liked poking around a lot um i did find it a little strange that 
like, so, you know, obviously there are a bunch of buildings and shops and stuff, and it felt like I could only enter about 50% of them at this point. And a lot of them were saying things just like, oh, it looks like they're not open yet or whatever. And I'm since this game doesn't have a time mechanic, there's no day night cycle. I'm guessing what that just means is like, oh, come back after you've beaten the next dungeon. Right. And then this door will open. Um, and that's fine. I'm not necessarily against that. Right. It is the kind of thing that you don't see done in top down Zelda a whole ton. Right. Um, like, I feel like in Link's Awakening, you would be able to go in the house, but you would just get some NPC dialogue or something that would just be like, you know, basically, oh, it's not time to talk to me yet or whatever, you know. Um, and so uh, I was I was trying to kind of keep a mental list of like, OK, these are the houses that I couldn't get in. I need to go and check back in on these first thing once I get done with this next dungeon. But um, but I mean, a, a lot of stuff to do, though. I mean, uh a very useful general store in this town. I feel like, mm-hmm. I feel like the store in castle town and Minish cap has got more useful things for you right off the bat, like a big wallet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I do think great business strategy for this shopkeeper, right? <laughs> sell like, a bigger wallet. <laughs> I'm going to sell you a bigger wallet, which you're going to then fill with more money to spend here. You know, like good on you guy. <laughs> That is probably the most intelligent businessman we've seen in any Zelda game ever. Good for yeah. him. Yeah. Um, definitely better than the than the parrot in Twilight Princess. Or the, or the lantern, or the lantern guy. guy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and, and just in terms of like NPCs that seem like they have fun things going on. I mean, I talk to a lot of people like the ghost. What Like, what's the deal with the ghost guy? Who's yeah, hanging, like, what's a, he doing? It's, a boo, it's like, a boo ghost that's yeah. just hanging out and you're with, uh, yeah. with a hat on and you're like, oh. Cool. Hey, it's like neat. Can't wait to figure out what your deal in is. In broad daylight. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody seems to mind. Mm. Yeah. And and some of the returning characters we like, "Oh, that's Andrew." Yeah. 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 Yep. Which is funny because there are a few things that I started to notice a bit more this week um that are aesthetic and audio connections to Ocarina of Time specifically, which is something that kind of started to filter out of the series the further that it gets from Ocarina of Time. But this was still, I mean, 2004, right? Uh, You know, it was a bit down the road from 1998 when Ocarina came out, but like Ocarina still like was, it was just, it loomed large in the consciousness at the time, right? Um, And so, and I'm sure they had access to all of these like sound bites and things and character art. And so the team working on this is probably looking to that a lot for inspiration. And it's really fun seeing that stuff in a top down setting, you know? Um, seeing uh, pixel art and you is great hearing mm. hearing specific like sound bites and clips from Ocarina of Time is is yeah. awesome and I think that's way where it's fun to have a bit of a, a mashup of other things because there are there are a few characters that like in each game there's you know a standout character or something that will become like in Majora's Mask Tingle became you know to some people's disdain a regular recurring character uh, <laughs> Some people motioning I'm, at I'm, Matt. I'm motioning at, at Matt. That you can't, hey, you can't hey, see it. Hey, um, hey. And then Wind Waker introduced Beetle. Um, and then both of those characters, I think, are in this game. Um, we've, and so, you know, this is the kind of thing where it's like they're gradually making a a lore of like it's not just Link and Zelda and Ganon that reincarnate and. All, exactly all right. this kind of thing there's just like random shopkeepers and stuff that yeah. <laughs> business scrubs right yeah. like another big ocarina of yeah time deals like you know yeah. works the exact same way here it's tons of fun um but anyway yeah I, I i i think that this is all really good fun and it's always it's always fun leo dicaprio pointing at the tv meme <laughs> when it happens right <laughs> yeah uh, which i really appreciate but um we're all in hyrule castle town did like do we want to call out some things that we just noticed while we were exploring in there or some things that were uh, there's so there's so much minish stuff in hyrule mm. castle town and i really wish that you could explore as a minish right now unfortunately you can't so i'm really really excited to go back i I don't know if i'll go back tonight but if not tonight it's probably going to be tomorrow like i'm i'm jazzed about exploring this game like there is something about the being able to see all the little tiny things that you know Mm -hmm. you can do as a minish and just like i want to go do that well like it's it's got me really excited in a way that most top-down games don't really get me excited about exploration this one is like yeah really working for me well it's the game making a promise to you right it's Mm. like you're in a space and you can see all of this minish infrastructure right as we called it earlier 
Um, and you're just kind of looking at it. And it's like, even, even though you can't get there right now, it's in some ways an even more exciting version of the Metroidvania thing we were just talking about. Right. Where it's like, yes, it's fun to see a hookshot gap and know that when I come back here, the hookshot will get me across it. Right. It's even more fun to be in a shop and to see all the little crisscrossing, like minish walkways, like up on the shelves and things be like, oh, I can't wait to get small and come back here and figure out what's going on in this space. Um, I agree with you completely, Matt. It's like it's it's such a cool, fun thing uh, that just very passively builds hype. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited. Um, well, what else? What else? What else? Uh, I think it's interesting that there are so many blocked off areas. Like not only do you have the guards that are blocking things off, but there's the dog who's standing in front of the stairs blocking you from getting to the furthest southwestern section, which I think is probably where the Minish uh, shrinker is. I'm, I'm going to assume that that's so there's, what the there's, game is blocking you from. There's also one there's one in a shop that you visited. There, or it's, in, you, it's in the shop. Yeah, yeah, but you need the cane of, of Pachi to yes, flip which, it over. which you now have. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right. Um, so yeah, like there's, there's just a lot of gating that's happening. Um, I actually spent a solid like 15 minutes trying to figure out how to get that dog to move because I thought the sword school was down there. And then I just happened to, I just happened to have not walked into the sword house of all the houses that I tried to walk into. I just missed this one. So when I found the sword house, I felt really dumb, but Anyway, yeah, so like the, I, th- I think it's going to be really cool. Um, you already talked about the store being really great. Uh, another shield, 10 bombs, 30 secret seashells, which we still don't know what they do at this point. At least I don't. I do. Kn- I, I didn't find out this week. Yeah, so uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good stuff to do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, and definitely. Uh, so last thing I really want to say about Hyrule Castle Town right now is that I'm just curious talking about this gating mechanic again. Obviously, we understand when the game does this for the purposes of keeping you out of an area with a new dungeon. Right. Uh, because it doesn't want you getting ahead of the main story. But when you're in an area like Castle Town, where you would think most of the concern uh, in there is going to be side quest related it makes me wonder if it's an uh a mechanic that's designed to keep like the main game side quests a little bit more segmented too um to keep it from being a situation like like in Link's awakening there comes a point in that game where you can truck through the entire trading quest if you just know where everything is right yeah um you know you can get that all done pretty much before you go into the like fifth fourth or fifth dungeon i think i think it's fifth um and so i wonder if this is more of uh, a way that they tried to kind of keep it to where you still have major side questy things um throughout the entirety of the game i don't know we'll see as we go forward but uh yeah i i definitely took note of that as well matt um so of course the main plot point that we're like i said earlier the main plot point we're trying to uh check off of our list this week is that we're trying to take the broken picori blade up mount cornell to the master smith what was the smith's name again malari yes yes Yes, there it is well it's confusing because malari is the smith but balari is the minish who gives you the bomb bag. So they have oh, a yeah. similar sounding. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh, to that end, we have to make an ascent up Mount Cornell um, in order to meet the minish who live there. Um, Cody, how do you, how do you enjoy this? I, I, are we calling this a take on death mountain or like for all intents and purposes, are we just kind of saying it's, it's that's what it is? Yeah. I mean, I think if you're climbing a mountain and there's rocks falling on you, that's death mountain. I think that's right. Yeah, yes. that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And if there's tectites, especially, uh, <laughs> and then it's really death. It's mountain. really death mountain. <laughs> yeah. You come to you come to find out that death mountain for in, in ancient Hylian history was always called Mount Cornell, and then those rocks just killed one too many people, and now it's death mountain. Yeah, I mean, look, death mountain is a. It's definitely a place with like a name that's got history. It's like, it's one of those things where like I always say, if you see a sign that says "Do not feed the monkeys," and there's a story there, someone's fed. The monkey. <laughs> exactly right. And so it's like Death Mountain. All right. What was it? Yeah. What was it, what called, was it before? called before it killed a bunch of people? <laughs> what was it called before it? Yeah. Mount Cornell. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I think, yeah, this is, this is a, um, a prequel if we're going by, uh, you know, if we're going by trying to figure out the timeline stuff, I mean, it's, it is obviously made by Capcom. They probably, 
didn't care that much. Right. But like they were just sort of. But that is that is in keeping with the vibe of the of the like the directors of the Zelda series would have approved of just like echoes more so than you know it, it's okay to just have a mountain that look, that's kind of like Death Mountain. Yeah. You know that's just as fine as having another Death Mountain. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, this is definitely, um, it's a death mountain. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It really is. Um, I like, th- so one thing I, w- I want to say real quick up front is that last week, Matt, I mentioned that there were, there was a fair amount of music in this game that I kind of remembered going into it that I was excited to hear again. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the Mount Cornell theme is definitely one of those. Um, there's not a whole lot to it. You know what? It's not super complicated. It just kind of repeats over and over and over. Um, but something about it. I just really love the Mount Cornell music. Yeah, fair um, enough. I don't know. It like it has a certain intensity um, that I feel like is is applicable to this space, you know? Yeah. Um, like mountain music in zelda games can feel kind of goofy sometimes especially because it's usually associated with the gorons right yeah and so like usually yeah we get a lot of like bongos and like that kind of thing um but this is this is feeling much more like oh this is like this is serious business let's go mountain climbing music and i i really enjoy that about it um the environment is also beautiful i mean this is an area of the game like we said last week the pixel art and the 16-bit Um, aesthetic is doing a lot for a lot of areas in this game. Minish Woods looked amazing, right? Uh, Mount Cornell similarly looks great. Very vibrant, like um, they're establishing tone and setting very well here. I think this is the kind of area that in a 16-bit game gets a lot of help from the extra graphical um, ability that they had, whereas something like, look, I love I love Tao Tao Heights in Link's Awakening, right? But some of the earlier top-down Zelda games weren't able to represent, like, the Rocky Mountain landscape mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. as, as this. This definitely feels rocky. Yeah. And, like, especially when you're in Minish form and you can't even get over the, like, semi-pebbly ground, it lo- it's just looks kind of textured when you're big person Link. Yeah. But when you're Minish, it's impassable. So, like, the way they continue to visually show you areas that are inaccessible to you as tiny link is really really cool Mm -hmm. and so well done and i think that's really making the absolute most of the 16-bit graphics that i think an 8-bit game would have a lot harder time doing yeah definitely well even an older 16-bit game i mean thinking about uh thinking about the way that death mountain looks um in a link to the past right a lot of like the textures and swatches and stuff that they used in that game you know, like, yeah, the colors were there, right? It was kind of like orangey dirt looking area, right? Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. they, but it was still not a level of detail that we're kind of seeing here, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and they were able to introduce like, you know, basically the, um, what's it, like the big leaf from the Wind Waker mm-hmm. as a, you know, as a gliding mechanic and that sort of thing. And they were able to represent yeah. that in 2D with pixels in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do on the Super Nintendo, I think. Yeah, I think that that's right. And by the way, I just love that. Yes, it's it's working the exact same as the Leaf in Wind Waker. I love that it's just the hat, though. You're using the hat as like a parachute. Right? Yeah, I, I do love that. It's really funny to see Ezlo get all yeah. big and puffed up. I will say um, depth perception is still something that's a little bit it, hard, it's hard to keep yeah. track of when we're doing something. Like, I know it gives you little, the little oval shadow on the ground that kind of helps you place your yourself within the terrain but it's still tough because the graphics don't have any depth from one another right no i mean look the game that solved this um a link between worlds used a mechanic that none of us played it with which is the 3d slider. which is the actual ability <laughs> to change things into 3d but i promise you that it does help with depth perception um but yeah the 2d games often have had those problems. One, yeah. The place that I noticed this the most was actually in kind of the clipping of some of the environments. Like I tech tights and other things would get lost behind some other environmental pieces that I couldn't see them at all. And then I just randomly get hurt and a tech tight would jump out from behind something. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I totally didn't know that there was an enemy over there because it's physically blocked by the clipping of a mountain or a rock or a hill or something and i was like oh well, that's kind of frustrating yeah and you know in fairness i think th- this game sort of handles height the same way that link's awakening does when you're using the rock's feather the thing is in link's awakening you're 
like when you use the rock's feather, you're elevated for such a short span of time, right? There's not really too much room to get too confused about what's happening. But here, when you're actually having to float from one place to another and you've got seconds, you know, tens of seconds in order to try and line things up correctly, um, you know, it's like it gives you plenty of time to do that. The margin isn't so razor thin that it's like, oh, this confused me visually and I failed it several times and that was annoying. Like, no, it was fine. You know, I never really had a, an issue with it. It's just uh, something that's worth calling out. I think um, it's, it's a tough problem to overcome, I'm sure. And I think that the, the development team deserves props for implementing it in a way that was not a major headache. Um, but it is, it, it's definitely a fun mechanic, right? I, I love to see it here. Um, so yeah, I, I thought a lot of the light puzzle solving that was required to get up the mountain was a lot of fun. We're doing a lot of moving back and forth between large link and minish link and doing the same thing we were doing in minish woods where we're finding like the little, the little crevices, right. That you can walk into and then you get the, the big pixel art scenery, except here it's mountainous instead of forest themed. And that's a ton of fun. We get a really fun moment here where we're in the middle of a rainstorm as minish link. And it's like, <laughs> Hey, these, these raindrops are big as boulders. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, Hey, these can actually hurt you. It's like, Oh, yep. Yes, they can. Uh, so, you know, those are all fun moments, but I, yeah, I really like the whole, the juggling of like growing beanstalks to get up the side of the mountain was it's fun to me. I don't know. Something about it was a it, good time. I thought it was really fun too, except that I, it took me way too long to realize you're supposed to pick up the bean sprout as Minish Link and carry it out and put it in the hole. I was oh, trying yeah. to like dump water on it and then the water didn't work. So I went all the way back to the mineral water spring, carried the mineral water all the way over, dumped the mineral water on it oh, and that's it didn't a, grow. That's a pain. Yeah. So yeah. I had to go back and then I, then I realized you could pick up the, so yeah, that was a pain in the butt. I wish there was a little more clear about picking it up, but look, I, I normally complain, or at least we have complained in the past about games signposting things too much. And this was a case of like, I probably should have been smart enough to figure out what I was supposed to do here. So this is a me problem, not a game problem. It That that bean sprout bulb thing does look too big for you to physically pick up when you're in that situation. Minish, yeah, with for it, sure. Though, right. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess it's an ant situation yeah. where <laughs> Link re retains his uh, strength in, yeah. in tiny form. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't pick up pots when you're in tiny form or whatever, but this this bean sprout thing, you absolutely can. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, it was nice because it takes a fair amount of time for you to get all the way up Mount Cornell from the very bottom. Um, and to be honest, like, it's still got a, a good amount of, like, twisty, turny passages into the mountain and stuff like that. Um, and it was a good time. I, I want to come back and do a little bit more exploring now that we've got access to a few more items and try to figure out if there's as much exploring to be done here as there is in, say, Telltale Heights or, mm -hmm. you know, Death Mountain in A Link to the Past or A Link Between Worlds, right? Because those both, those are both very wide ranges that have got a lot of doors in and out all over the place and lots of different little caves and stuff with things to find mm -hmm. and it felt like mount cornell was a little bit more to the point right yeah i i did i i think it's where i upgraded my bomb bag um i did find that very yeah and so there, there's a couple things like that mm -hmm. um but i'm not yeah i don't know that it's that open yeah, um, there uh, there were a few kinstone doors that were kind of sealed oh, yes. up that I noticed, right? So yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's something that's gonna keep coming back throughout the whole game is that when you fuse kinstones with someone, some random random door somewhere or some tree or whatever suddenly becomes an entrance. Yeah. Um, and so you'll be backtracking to every area, finding new stuff in the old zones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we make it all the way through Mount Cornell and we get to the, uh, what, what was this, the Cornell Mines? Is that the name of the place where the miniature are hanging out at? Yeah, I think so. Hold on one second. Sounds right. It's, uh, where's the name? Tell me the name. It, it's Cornell Mines. Okay, cool. 
Uh, so, of course, you know, before we get into our discussion about Malari and the stuff that gets us to the dungeon, we do need to mention that here uh, we get another situation where we've got to pick up an item that you don't actually use once you get it. Once it's in your inventory, you just passively gain the benefits from it. But like last week, we had the Jabbernut. This week, we have to find a way to actually be able to climb the rock walls. Um, and, of course, the way that we do that is the grip ring, right? So I, I wonder if this is going to be a thing that kind of is just something we can expect in each dungeon area as we go through the game, right? It's like mm-hmm. there's going to be an impassable barrier of some kind, whether it's you can't talk to these people or you can't climb the rock wall or whatever, um, and you're going to have to find something like this, which just lives in your inventory. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's been made pretty clear from foreshadowing, wandering around, that there's like the ability to traverse water and... Yeah, that's, definitely we're going to have to find flippers somewhere or something, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, and it's definitely something that you basically get it at the top, and now that you've gotten it, it's significantly easier to get up and down the mountain because yeah. there was a just direct rock climbing path the whole time that you couldn't use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm sorry, it's Mount Crenell, the Crenell Wall, and Malari's Mines. The Crenell Mines are what is the Cave of Flames now because it's what the humans dug. Oh, gotcha, yeah, okay. Yeah. So gotcha. It's, there's a little bit of confusion. There's both the Crenell Mines and Malari's Mines. Yeah, that makes sense. I did think it was interesting, like, right before, like, at the very end of this whole thing, almost right before you go and, and you see Malari, you get to the Malari Mines, um, we get the rainy area, which mm-hmm. it, was, it was fun, like, having that change of weather it's a good time but it was using like the ganon music in there which kind yeah. of was uh, and totally a little weird right yeah. like you're going to a cave of flames and you get a stormy section but it's a very brief stormy i'd like to see how big this rain cloud was and like why it's just over this one <laughs> tiny <laughs> right. section of a volcano yeah so yeah, yeah i have some questions cool uh but anyway we get to the malari mines and here we meet malari and all of his apprentices um who uh you know he makes it clear that he he will be able to reforge the sword assuming that we're able to assemble all of the elements together um fun little characters i like the design of all of these guys malari himself looks really neat yeah he's definitely the coolest looking Minish in my opinion he uh he definitely fits the description of like a mountain man Minish uh kind of feels like king of the dwarves esque you know what I mean yeah um mm. I like him a lot yeah the the Minish are I guess yeah they fulfill a few sort of old fantasy roles of like you know elves but not in the not in the Tolkien way elves in the uh people who do you who make your the cobbler's shoes for them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is in fact in Iron Castle Town is a, a cobbler and a, and a mysterious Minish uh, entrance, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, but yeah, you sort of in this case they're working as a sort of yeah blacksmith, um, so you can see they're sort of yeah very very talented, just hiding around Hyrule. Uh, Getting all the work done. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, And, you know, of course, it would be just too easy if they could fix your sword right then and there. You know, so we got to got to drop that off and come back for it later. Um, This is, uh, you know, this is the whole section of game that tees up what's going to be the dungeon for this week, which, as Matt just mentioned, we've got Malari's Mines, which is the the Minish Mine. Um, And then they spend a lot of time talking about the Crenell Mine, which is the one that humans made um, and is now the Cave of Flames. Malari tells us that uh, one of the so the earth element, the one that one of the four that we need to infuse the blade and to repair it um, is actually the fire element. Oh, you're right. Sorry, Earth was last week. Yes. Yeah. It's confusing because, Earth, like, in Zelda games, like, the Earth and Fire, they They, they get, cross over. You know? Well, especially Skyward Swords, Earth Temple is the Fire Temple. Yeah. Right. I see yeah. where, okay, I see cool, where the cool, confusion cool. is, so, but this is Fire. The red one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The yes. red one. The red one. Uh, yeah, the Fire Element is located in the Cave of Flames. Who'd have thunk it? Um, and so we can't get in there uh, without permission directly from Malari, but we do get that. Um, and then before you know it, we're at the dungeon. Do we have have anything else that we want to say about Mount Cornell and all of that stuff generally before we get into our conversation about the Cave of Flames? No, I'm good. Let's let's talk about it. Cool. All right. This brings us to part three, which is the dungeon map, where we talk about this week's dungeon from mechanics to music and more. This week's dungeon is the Cave of Flames, uh, ostensibly this game's fire dungeon. Uh, The layout of the Cave of Flames is asymmetrical. It is laid out much like a mine would be. It's several stories 
uh, labyrinthine. It's one of my favorite words, right? <laughs> um, uh, which includes a very fun little mechanic uh, involving mine carts where uh, we have a series of mine carts set throughout the dungeon, uh, tracks that can be reorganized um, so the carts can go to one place versus another. Um, in terms of enemies that we have in here, we've got a lot of, what are the, what are the spiky spiky guys called that you have to turn over with your shield? Uh, aren't they Helmosaurs? No, they're not Helmosaurs. I think they might just be spiked beetles. Okay. <laughs> sure why not uh spiked beetles we have a few like likes we do have helmosaurs in here um yes. but that's not what i was talking about we have red chews we've got a new variety of chew which is the spiny chew they're the, the gray ones who turn spiky when you try to attack them yes and we've got drum roll please bob bombs just <laughs> just bob bomb. yeah, like that's Mar- what they're called they're mario Kart. Yeah. yeah or they're mario bob bombs yes yep. so cool yeah, that's a, that's an influence from Link's Awakening. We've got just a boo hanging out in Hyrule Castle Town, and we've got a bob bomb and a chain chomp in Link's Awakening as well. Yeah, yeah. That, there are lots of Mario crossover in the top downs for sure. Exactly, but we didn't we did not have bob bombs in Link's Awakening though. So mm, they, true, they finally get their their appearance here, which is nice. Um, yeah, let's talk about the Cave of Flames, Cody. How did you feel about this one? Um, I I thought it was fun. Uh, I thought. I mean, why well, uh, should we talk about the item? Sure. Yeah, we can go ahead and okay. get right into. I that. think the so the item is fun because it is on paper it is the most one note like odd little obscure item of all time. It turns things upside down. <laughs> <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> like you would think that this is a this is you know Twilight Princess hours where it's going to be like oh here's an item that you'll use once and then never remember again. Exactly. Um, but it is, you know, to the to the game's credit, this is, you know, once you discover, oh, it's not only you can turn things upside down, you can put it into a hole and it turns the hole upside down into a spring. Yeah. And you sort of have more going with it. Um, and, yeah, I, I just think that it was a really interesting use of a, an item that's just the most specific item in the in the zelda series possibly in terms of what it can actually do yeah um i love the name of it too so the cane of pachi uh i was trying to pacci like yeah. pachi patchy passy <laughs> i don't know i'm calling it the cane so- of pachi sawyer would call it a passy yes the, the cane, cane of passy pass. yeah um sawyer is like a two or three passy kid when he goes to bed if he doesn't have all three of those passies then he's, it's he's not going to bed. oh it's not happening um man i am not looking forward to the day that we need to start trying to shut that down <laughs> anyway um whew, uh yeah so yeah the cane of pachi it, it, it is a really fun item for sure you know i would i think my first impression of it would have been a lack of excitement just because it feels like the kind of item in a Zelda game that would not have a lot of play outside of the dungeon that you get it in. Right. Except we've already seen a fair amount of stuff in the overworld that you think back to it and you're like, Oh, this, this crazy cane is what I needed for that. Like, right. Yeah. Like when you're wandering the Hyrule castle town, you see pots and it's like, well, you know that there's a type of pot that you can get small in, but this one's, it's the wrong way around. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, well, it would be great if you could, now we have a thing for that. If you could turn that upside down, yeah, exactly. it's like an infomercial. It's like you, know. you want to turn that thing upside down? Have yeah. buy the cane of Pachi for yeah, twelve ninety nine. Yeah. It's like oh, you've got so many pots, but you just can't turn them upside down. <laughs> <laughs> if only there was some way to help for only five easy payments. Yes, twelve ninety nine shipping and handling not included. Yeah, exactly right. Um, no oh, man, you buy the family value pack, you get a red cane of Pachi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, um, <laughs> now it's a his and hers. One's blue and one's pink. I know, right? <laughs> Everyone gets a cane of Pachi. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 it's such a goofy item, right? And especially like canes. Uh, this is a this is a type of item that doesn't really happen in 3D Zelda games all that much. But the 2D games have tons of them, right? Oh, like, they love canes. Yeah, they're, they're just like here's a cane that makes blocks of sand. Here's, you know, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> uh, and this one flipped things upside down. And you know what? In fairness, it actually does lead to a fair amount of fun mechanics within this dungeon, right? Um, if it was just 
uh, if it was only good for like flipping the carts over so that you could get access to those, then it would have been pretty lackluster. Right. But, um, I mean, there's a fair amount of like, so one, the holes, right. That you can jump in and then they launch you out up to second floors or whatever. So that's all great. Um, a fair number of enemies that are actually susceptible to this thing, which is really nice. Um, it's great because I knew immediately how to deal with the spiked beetles. Once I saw them the first time, I was like, I played links awakening. I just pull out my shield and then boop them and then they're good to go. Right. Um, but I was, hey. lo- I was looking for a hammer personally. Okay. Gotcha. Well, now we've got the cane of Pachi and you don't have to deal with any of that, which means <laughs> that the two seconds that the shield had to live in my equipped inventory have now gone away and the shield goes back in the backpack. Um, it's nice because able to just like flip and break pots without having to go over press r to lift and then throw right Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. great i i am a like generally speaking in in any zelda game this isn't an issue in 3ds but in top downs i typically get pretty annoyed when it's the kind of top down zelda game where you're not able to destroy pots with your sword Uh uh-huh right there's two types usually there's got to pick up and throw and then there's just you can hit hit them with your sword and they break right um i like there to be as few barriers between me and breaking the pots as possible i want to be able to break the pot however i want to break the pot and the cane of pachi is here for me you can now break pots okay so we talked last week linda you and i about how this game has only the two item buttons and the sword and the shield are both an item that has to be assigned to a button and last week at the end of the episode i said almost verbatim I really hope this game doesn't make me go in and out of my item selection screen super frequently. And you know what? It is doing exactly that. And I'm actually kind of mad about it. Like it's very, very, very annoying. It really do be doing. I am constantly in my item menu changing things. So this is the thing about Minish Cap that would be very helped by a like switch remaster in the style of Link's Awakening, Mm -hmm. because this is Look, so you've played, I think, two games so far where this was a big problem, but you played the remake version where it wasn't. Yeah. Ocarina of Time and Link's Awakening, and then you're going to have Majora's Mask later. Yeah. And it really does make it, they, they're usually the biggest, the biggest imp- UI improvements are always the fact that you can have just more buttons. Mm-hmm. Um, because, yes, the Game Boy Advance has a B button and an A button, and two bumpers. And the two bumpers. Yeah. As much as I love having the roll function in this game, I think that I would have comfortably lost the roll in like in exchange for just being able to have our shield bound to the bumper mm. up there. Well, I don't understand why shield can't be bound to left bumper. Left bumper is currently doing nothing. It's for uh, it's for kinstones. Kinstone fusion. Okay, but you can't tell, like, Kinstone Fusion happens in a sub-menu. So, like, when you're not in that sub-menu, why can't Shield well, just be bound you, to your left you actually, bumper? When you actually want to fuse with somebody, <laughs> uh, you have to walk up to them and push left bumper, and then it starts the whole That's so dang annoying. Much like in real life. When you, yeah. yeah, you have to left bumper when you want to, when you want to fuse. Yes. We're going to stop this right now. <laughs> We're going to continue on with the episode. That's wise. <laughs> <laughs> I need I need to find the Spock from Wrath of Khan sound. That is wise. <laughs> that is why. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you do. I really need to get that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but any. I, OK, so you're right. I don't think that that's anything that is like so intrinsically tied to moment to moment gameplay that you couldn't have done done it some other way. And then, then sure. it's like, yeah, OK, now it's your shield. And the, the point stands. You're right. Lots and lots of inventory management this week, um, because within the Cave of Flames, I mean, like we already said, your shield has to come out and it gets some play. Um, the gust jar, you know, there's a there's enemies in here that you can only really take care of using the gust jar. Yep. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, part of why it's annoying that you have to go into the menu so much is because there's so many good items in the menu. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is a great problem to have is mm-hmm. the item from the previous dungeon is still really cool, so I still default equip it when I'm not doing other things. Right, Yeah. Um, and, and I do completely agree. I mean, it's like this is a it's a it's an annoying thing to have to deal with. But I do really appreciate that we're still using all of these things, especially after last game. Right. Yeah. Where with Twilight Princess, right. it was the, just, the number yeah. the world's number one example of useless items that yes. stop being useful after the dungeon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think this is something that, yeah, I really like the gust jar. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you probably would have talked about this on last week's. Um, show, but the gust jar, like there's sort of two types of 
wind type items in Zelda games. There's the sort of annoying one that doesn't really do anything and sort of stuns enemies. And then there's the ones that feel really good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this ended up being the type that feels Feels really good. good, For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I I wanted to talk a little bit about the variety of enemies that are in this dungeon. Um, We've already mentioned a lot of them, right? But uh, one thing that did come up last week, Matt, was that we had said one thing that felt interesting about the Deepwood Shrine was that the enemies we were fighting in there all felt bespoke to this game, right? They were enemy types that you don't see in other top-down Zelda games. We weren't fighting Chews or mm-hmm. Like Likes or Moldorms or whatever. And we had mentioned how that f- wasn't necessarily a problem, but it did it did make that experience feel kind of set apart from typical top-down Zelda fare. And the reason, like we didn't even get into this at all, but the reason for why that is 100% just came to me uh, while I was playing this game the other night, which is that... That dungeon was a dungeon that you do entirely at minish size. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Um, and the Cave of Flames is one where we're full size Link, right? And so basically what they're doing is they have a separate set of enemies that can appear when you're minish size versus when you're full size, which makes total sense, right? Right. And that that was the whole, the whole punchline of the first dungeon was, all right, you've been facing these tiny enemies. Here's a just... A regular overworld, overworld enemy that you defeat in two hits. Yeah. But it's a boss now for you because you're so small. Mm. Like a keese would be a terrifying dragon-like creature for, for Minish Link. Yeah. Like that would well, be horrible. And it would be dumb if like in Deepwood Shrine, the enemies were all regular, right? It's like you're just, you're fighting trash mob chews and keese and stuff. But it's like, oh, but here, but here's this one that's actually big, right? You know, yeah. it's like it, it would have made no sense, you know? Um, so, and like I say, last week we, we, we weren't saying that that was like a knock against the experience or anything, but it's nice that the reason for doing that just kind of came to me independently and nobody had to explain it to me. Like I figured it out on my own. Yay. And it makes uh, sense in the in world explanation. Like, it yeah, does. it yeah. makes total sense. 100%. Um, anyway, so, uh, this dungeon, I wouldn't call it necessarily combat heavy. Um, you know, it, it, moderate light yeah. to moderate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's got a it's got a pretty good mixture of, of combat and puzzles. Mm-hmm. So I would say mostly on the puzzles yeah. um, and on uh, it's a lot about traversal and going in rooms to affect other rooms, uh, you know, making sure that you're hitting the switches for the rail cart and it's, stuff like that. It's a very video gamey place, by which I mean, like if there was a real mining operation there, then I have no idea how, why they've had locations accessible only by minecart mine yeah. that just travel randomly two rooms and then stop. <laughs> <laughs> and the only way that you can get to the lever is by turning into a, an ant and crawling <laughs> across to the next room <laughs> and then turning big again. It's like this mining operation's... No wonder they abandoned it. <laughs> it's, it's not logically laid out. It doesn't work. <laughs> Definitely not OSHA approved, right? I didn't see handrails anywhere. Anymore. And there's a lot of lava. A lot of, and lava. lot of lava. The speed that those minecarts go. Yeah. <laughs> hazardous, you know? Of like, we didn't even have to sign a disclaimer. Like, crazy. Uh, yeah, we didn't waver up before going into this dungeon. It's a, It was a big oversight. Yeah. yeah, so, Matt, I have a question for you. What is your question, Lyndon? How do you like minecarts? I like minecarts a lot. I would totally ride a minecart. Yeah? Yeah, totally. Okay. I, it feels like Indiana Jones at the Temple of Doom. Yeah, it, it definitely does. Um, here's my thing about minecarts in this dungeon. So I, I agree with you. Minecarts, just as a general concept, really good. Mm-hmm, Super mm-hmm. fun, right? In my head, I was remembering this as the minecart dungeon, more so than the fire dungeon. Right? Really? And I think I was setting myself up for disappointment because even though like, yes, there are mine carts in here and they're they're fun enough for what they are. For some reason, I was imagining a dungeon scenario where there was a lot more like we were mentioning like a Donkey Kong Country mine controversy. (laughs) Not no, not necessarily, although I think that'd be really fun. I think I was imagining a situation where the mine carts were a bit more intrinsically linked to getting around the dungeon at all points of it, right? Uh and even to the point where there was like some complication with the path that the mine carts could go on, you know? Like I know that we have a mechanic right where we've got to switch 
paths, right? And that that is something that's done here. But in my head, it was like a situation where, oh, you know, there's like three different paths you could choose. And like one sends you to this corner of the dungeon, one sends you over here, one sends you over here. And you had to kind of like keep track of like the crisscrossing paths. And because like other Zelda games have done versions of that, right? Um, I forget which dungeon it is, but I know A Link to the Past has got a version of that in the in the dark world dungeon um uh, which one is that uh turtle rock in a link to the past i think could be wrong mm-hmm. anyway uh anyway but it, all that is to say it amounts to a much more simplistic system here than i think i was anticipating yeah no i i mean i don't i didn't remember i don't remember any of these dungeons at all like i i am i again told totally this on the way here i i'm playing this game so much the so removed so or so long removed from the last time I played it that I barely remember any of it. So this is all this is all basically newish to me. Um, and so I, I definitely didn't have the same sense of like disappointment about the mine carts. I just thought it was kind of a quirky, fun mechanic. Like, yeah, it wasn't overly utilized and it definitely wasn't like game changing in any way, shape or form. But it was kind of fun and uh, like it was fine. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't have that same reaction as you did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where it's totally fine. And this was, it, this was still a lot of fun, but I think the reason that it took a little something away from the whole experience for me is because I was imagining that there was going to be a certain complexity to the dungeon layout that didn't end up really being there because at the end of the day, this dungeon is fairly linear. It doesn't really look like it would be right, but it's, it's kind of hard to get lost in here, I guess is what I'm getting at. You know, there's not a whole lot of backtracking that's necessarily required. You're really just kind of following it from room to room to room to room, um, with, with one or two small exceptions, but yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. It's definitely not a complicated dungeon. No, yeah, no. I, I would say uh, Deepwood Shrine actually was uh, significantly more complicated than this one. Right? I, I I would agree with that. Yeah, for sure. What do you think, Cody? Are we are we saying true things here? Yeah, I mean, look, it's um, I enjoyed it as a dungeon, but it's not really a. It's not. I mean, as I was saying before, it's a very video gamey sort of dungeon where it, it's just the minecarts are there because it would be fun to have a puzzle with. Minecarts, Mine yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, but that also means that there's not like because yeah. you can have a like Skyward Sword, you can have like an abandoned mining facility, and it's like, oh, here's the there's a you know, there's things that went on in the past in this mining facility, mm-hmm. and it all it all adds up, and you know, the the electricity is off, but you can turn it on, and, you know, mm-hmm. it's not it's not that kind of yeah. thematic dungeon, it's just a there was a mine here. There's some mine carts. Mm-hmm. You have to, you know, pull some switches and change some mine tracks. Yeah. Um, you know, it's good for what it is, which is a, a second dungeon that's not, you know, not particularly thematic or anything. Yeah. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom Fire Temple was like big in my mind while I was doing this, right? Because I was like, just talk about your complicated mine cart situation, you know? <laughs> that was a very complicated mine cart situation, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, but uh, still a lot of fun. You know, one thing this dungeon doesn't have was a mini boss fight. That's true. We totally skipped that this week, which is, I mean, you kind of had the broom with all the spike ball chews, which I guess they was kind of that, but yeah. just drop a few bombs and yeah. slice your so, way out of the circle. Sorry. What was the, what, what how did we get the chain of... Cane of Pachi again? I think it's immediately after the room that Matt's talking yeah, about. Yeah, okay. right you now. kill all the bomb chews, all okay. the spike chews, and then so you that is the- that is the sort of yeah, yeah, the mini boss in in the sense of like that's where you yeah get the it's, get the it's item it's serving the, the same function yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and you know I do miss that a little bit because I I think that there were I think that there was room to do something a little bit more involved than just the spiky chews here for sure. Um, it's fine. It's not a big deal. The other thing was, uh, did you, how many heart pieces did you find in here? There's only one in this dungeon. Okay, cool. Good. I, I went back through, like, I, I actually spent a good 10 minutes just kind of like looking back at the map, walking back through a little bit. It's like, did I miss anything? You, I don't know. So, I mean, did you get the compass? Because you should be able to check on I did, I did get the compass. On yeah. the map. Yeah. yeah. But I just had it so ingrained in my, especially since Deepwood had two heart pieces and we just got done playing Twilight Princess where it's each dungeon has two heart pieces, right? I was just, 
uh, kind of expecting it's like okay i'm gonna find two hard pieces in here right Mm -hmm. and so um anyway glad to hear that i wasn't going crazy and that there is only the one you're not crazy in this regard thank you yes i'll take i'll take that (laughs) (laughs) oh man um uh do we have anything else we want to say about the cave of flames before we start talking about uh the boss boss fight I mean, I will say that getting the item, um, you're I mean, I mean, as a as a Zelda uh, enthusiast, I feel like your immediate thought might be, all right, what kind of turtle do we need to use this cane? <laughs> on? <laughs> <laughs> I did immediately Uh-oh. think about the turtles. Yes, <laughs> and it ends up not even being a turtle. I mean, it's kind of a turtle. Uh, so the name of this dungeon's boss is Glee Rock. You know what it looks like, Lyndon? What? It looks like Lugia. It does kind of look it like Lugia. It looks like Lugia from uh, Pokemon uh, Soul Silver. So, or Pokemon uh, Silver. So I was thinking Blue Eyes White Dragon. While also like, works. Yes, also works. But only the neck section. For sure. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, neither of these two dragon-esque characters that we mentioned have a giant rock on their back like a turtle. So it's like if you yes. crossed... The turtle from Turtle Rock with either Lugia or Blue Eyes White Dragon. That's yeah, what you, that's what you definitely. have. Definitely. I mean, I think the name is supposed to be a play on, on a Glee-oc. on a Gleeoc, right? Sure. That's a Glee Rock because <laughs> it's got, got a rock. rock. It's got yeah. a ra- oh wow, so clever. There you go. <laughs> they should tell that to the cadence of Hyrule people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, oh. Glee Rock because yeah. that could, then it could be a song, right? This, yeah, yeah, it's the well, Glee Rock because. Yeah. So, because Cadence of Hyrule, if you haven't played it, all the bosses are like Glee, Orkenspiel, or whatever, you yeah, know. They're musically. Yeah. yeah, they're all like music puns. So, that's funny. <laughs> Hold on. Cadence of Hyrule bosses. We're going to go on a rabbit trail here, real quick. They're not necessarily good puns, but. They're <laughs> not necessarily good puns. Okay, so we've got Bass Guitarmos Knights. Nice. Those are good. Go Maracas. <laughs> Not as good. Gleok and Spiel. <laughs> well, Matt, hey, you're not ready for this one. Oh, no. Wiz Robo. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Oct- Octavo. Uh, Ganon. Just okay. Ganon. <laughs> the Necro Dancer. Ah, King Dobongo. <laughs> Synthrova. And okay, yeah, yeah the there's, there's okay. Some, you can get some, some truly excellent <laughs> instrumental puns there. Yeah, well, they're excellent just because they're instruments you won't expect. Like the Wiz Robo is like you're bringing in the oboe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of all the instruments, the oboe. All right, it's a noble, noble instrument. Yeah, uh, one of the few double reeded instruments. Let's just let's let's get back to our discussion about Glee Rock. <laughs> not uh, not Cadence by Rule. No, it's not a pun. It's not a pun. Well, it is just only on the one level. Though. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, fun enough boss fight. I, th- I thought it was hysterical. This, oh man, that's you, you okay? That's busy there? thinking it's about fine. the oboe. You good? It's fine. Okay. I'll join you eventually. It's, it's okay. fine. Good, good pod happening over that here. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, Glee Rock. I thought it was kind of funny. Basically, this boss fight is happening in the King Dodongo boss fight arena, right? Yes. Same, like. D- d- simplest room possible it's just a square room with a square pit of lava in the very middle of it and that's where the boss lives you know if it ain't broke don't fix it it's kind of yeah. how i feel about that it's fair. um the fight itself is fun enough the thing is it was very obvious very early on in the fight what you needed to do in order to i mean it was obvious immediately right it was yeah. obvious when you got the item like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. there's exactly, an item on exactly. the boss, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So the way that it works is that you have to use the cane of Pachi to flip over the rock on Glee Rock's back, and then that triggers a damage phase where you can walk over his neck. His neck becomes a bridge, and you can go to, like, the center of his body and hit it with your sword. Um, and it, it's it's fun enough for what it is. I, I think... It is a it's a boss fight that does not go too super quick. You know, you can't you can't f- completely wipe him um, in, you know, one or two damage phases. You got to do this three or four times. Um, and so I do appreciate that. I really I wish that there had been some mechanic that ramped up the difficulty of this boss fight about halfway through. 
You mean the pit of lava expanding wasn't ramped up difficulty enough when him spewing fire across a quarter of the arena? Lyndon, those are ramp up difficulty things. I didn't think it was hard. I didn't either. Okay. No, I was I was joking. Okay. It was satirical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was like it was a little annoying. I I sort of was right near the end I was I was one hit short and then trying to get the final hit it was like all right this this entire places on fire <laughs> and, and so which was fun because i had to get out the dungeon item from the last your dungeon. sword your sword does work the, on the sword does the work flames. on it but the if you want to clear out like an entire uh row, row of them it's e- yeah either you do that or you just run into them and you can clear them out by just sort of using the invincibility frames from the the I'm on fire running really fast <laughs> yeah. animation. Which I thought was really funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a shame because even though it is a fun enough fight, like we're saying, not a whole lot of difficulty, not a whole lot of mechanical variety. Um, it's a shame because I think about the way that a lot of bosses were handled in especially a game like Link's Awakening, right? Um, where a lot of those bosses, you know, the genie, um, the crazy snake thing and catfish's maw, you know, like it is possible to do a top down Zelda boss that has got phases and has got a variety of mechanics and a little bit more intrinsic difficulty to it. Right. Um, you well, know. I think this is, this is much more, um, in that very specific malt, like be- like in terms of the, you get the item um, in the dungeon, use that, you know, use that to defeat the boss is not what was going on in Link's Awakening a lot of the time. Right. Um, you know, it, instead it was just like, here's an annoying little box with lots of faces um, and you know, have to throw your bombs at it and annoyingly you always miss. Uh, and then you rewind time three seconds using the switches. Uh, rewind time feature. Exactly. Yes. Um, but you know that that was that was just bosses. Whereas this is like this is the Zelda formula as as established. It was sort of this era where they where there was a lot of that. You know, because this was Twilight Princess was only like it was the year after this game. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so they're in this era. They were really leaning really hard into the you know, into this sort of, I mean, yeah, I mean, because Wind Waker was also very like, you know, oh, use the item on the on the boss and then hit it three times and then on the third time it will, you know, do the thing. So I think that's sort of the, yeah, it is very by the numbers, the Minish Cap in a lot of ways, which is good because it's like, it's nice to have a, a good and smooth one of these, but. If there was a criticism I would make of it is is that it, it probably did stick to a lot of this stuff very um, stringently. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I, I think that's a good final word on this whole deal. Do mm-hmm. you agree, Matt? I agree completely. Wonderful. All right, well, that brings us to part four, which is bloopy trails where we talk about interesting things that diverted our attention this week um and you know last week we had a difficult time really coming up with anything to talk about here because a lot of this game's side quests basically all of them don't really become available until this week so um yeah let's go ahead and just talk about what we got up to that was a a a side item matt would you like to go first um i i didn't have a ton i did some kinstones but uh that, that was really it. I, I tried to explore a lot, but I didn't really find too many side questies to, to get up to. Well, so let's spend a minute talking about Kenstones because we we didn't spare any time talking about that system at all last week because we didn't have access to it yet. Um, this week we get our Kinstone bag and we get kind of an explainer of the entire system. Uh, and basically what Kinstones are is friendship bracelets that you're constructing with all the different NPCs of this world. Um and uh, so the way that it works is that you collect kinstone halves and each half is so there's uh, red ones, green ones and blue ones. And then they're cut in half in different contours. Right. Um, so they they have like different geometries. And when you look at them in your menu, you can <coughs> kind of tell what the, what shapes you have. And when you go to try and fuse kinstones with an NPC, you can see you can see which shape of stone they have, and then you can kind of tell, like, okay, do I have the one that goes with this? Um, 
And when you successfully fuse a kinstone, um, it has a variety of effects. Uh, the one that they show you immediately when you do the first one, that's like the one that's given to you as part of that whole little intro quest is, um, it opens up a, uh, it opens up a tree, right? A tree cave, which what was in there again? A uh, piece of art. Oh, right. Okay, cool. So, uh, kind of setting the expectation that fusing kinstones can do things like open up sealed doorways that lead to places. Um, I forget what else they do. I feel like you can get rupee rewards for them. Maybe there's sort of a variety of things that happen with these. Um, Matt, give me your first impressions on the kinstone system, because this is kind of the big, one of the big recurring side focuses of the game. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting way to get you to interact with more NPCs. Like, that's obviously the primary thing that it wants you to do is go interact with NPCs all around Hyrule to see what other things you can do. So I I think it's good in that respect. I also think it's a really good way to get you to explore Hyrule in general. You spend more time going to new areas or re-exploring old areas. Uh, So it, it incentivizes you to do two things that a lot of players I think may not really engage with, especially if they're not avid Zelda players or they're not, you know, super experienced Zelda players. They just kind of go dungeon to dungeon. But this is really incentivizing the player and guiding the player to experience the overworld in general. And I think it's a very clever idea, a very good way to do it. Yeah. How about you, Cody? Yeah, I think it's fun. It's it's not too um complex there's not much interaction you basically you find the the correct matching kinstone and then you connect and you see it the fun part is you see a little biography and name and everything for all these random little characters right which is which is a lot of fun uh and then a secret unlock so i I think it's a good little system yeah i agree it's so fun because as As the main collectible economy in this game, it's immediately doing something that's much more fun and interesting than, say, gold sculptula tokens or whatever, right? Mm. Because with the gold sculptula tokens, all you're doing is collecting them and trying to hit a certain number, you know? But with this, you've got two phases to the thing. You've got the collection, right? And then you've got the search, right? To try to find the NPC that's got the piece that goes with the one that you have. Um, And so... It intrinsically just has a lot more investment tied to it, um, which which is really, really great. I think it it honestly it makes it a really fun system. And the chase of the whole thing is exciting and fun. Right. Whenever you whenever you see that an NPC has got the little bubble, then you kind of get excited. Right. Because you're like, oh, okay, I want to see which one you have. And it's like, do I have that one? And when you do have it, it's like great dopamine hit, right? You're just like, oh, sweet, I'm getting a reward, you know? (laughs) Um, And when you don't have it, it's like, cool, I need to be looking out for that. And now I'm curious about what I get from doing that whole thing. It's it's a really, really fun little little whole system. Um, And I don't know. I I recall it being one of the bright spots of this game. Um, I really, really like Ken Stones just as a thing. And... Um, I hope it's not the sort of deal where the actual rewards that you get from engaging with this don't bear out the the effort that goes into it. I don't remember, really. Um, my recollection is that there is a good smattering, a good variety of kinstones that are required to advance certain story beats and also ones that are just purely optional that get you some cool stuff. So um, we'll see how that all pans out. Uh, in addition to kinstones, what all did I do? So um, I initiated the start of a side quest that may not even look like a side quest at this point, but um, using the gust jar, you can clear off a dirty uh, sales platform that's in Hyrule Castle Town Square. Um, and a vendor will show up there later um, if you went to the trouble to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, heart pieces, of course. Um, oh, and then we've got to talk about our first visit to Swift Blades Academy. Hmm. Yes, yes. Swift Blade, what a guy. Yeah, so I don't think we can accurately call this a side quest right now just because you have to do this in order to get to Mount Cornell. But... Unless I'm remembering it incorrectly, I don't think it's a requirement of the game for you to get all of the techniques from Swift Blade. Um, no, I'm, I mean, look, Swift Blade unlocks techniques such as like being able to break jars with your sword 
Yeah. Oh yay, good. <laughs> like that well, kind of thing. As previously, so you're go see as previously so, stated, so, I'm yeah, really into that kind of thing. So, you know, very exciting for the people here, but obviously not <laughs> something that makes or breaks your ability to get through a, a okay. dungeon. Fair enough, yeah. So uh more more just kind of acknowledging Swiftblade as a going bloopy trail concern past this point. Uh, I don't want to say too much more about him at the moment. Um because I'm going to say more about him in the next section. But, uh, yeah. So, um, Cody, how about you? Any, any, um, I mean, I did, I did a few, th- you know, I got a bigger wallet. Mm-hmm. I, um, I did a bunch of the Kaku, uh, game, you know, the returning yep. the, mm-hmm. to the point where I, I could, um, with the current item set that I have, yep. um, you know, I g- gained a bunch of money, um, yeah, bought the boomerang. Um, not not actually that great an investment because you can get a magic boomerang later without paying for it. Okay. Uh, but I was maxed out at three hundred rupees, and I was gonna go somewhere, and I was like, "All right, well, let's let's buy the boomerang at the store for three hundred rupees." Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did a bunch of that that sort of thing, and then obviously there's the stuff that's you know sort of required, but I wandered into it just randomly like the the business scrub that gives you a bottle and right yeah okay so uh, which again like you need that bottle in order to get up mount cornell right but right but it wasn't directed to me to go get it i was just exploring when i found it i did i did the same thing yeah um yeah for sure uh cucko minigame is definitely a good time poor angie i i want her to be able to have a uh, well i guess actually she does have a different occupation than cucko lady in majora's mask but um Anyway, it's it's something that she just does, right? Is keep cuckoos a lot. Um, so yeah, definitely a fun little mini game there. Um, I will say that uh, I so I did also find we mentioned this briefly in passing earlier. I found the big fairy uh, that upgrades your mm. bomb bag, and that ended up being a very good thing to find because this is a game that's asking you to use bombs a lot. Yeah, an upgrade from ten to thirty is really yeah. really helpful. Yes. So highly recommend doing that. That great fairy is uh, up in the caves of Mount Cornell. So definitely search that one out if you haven't already. Um, All right, let's go ahead and get into part five, which is Z-targeting, where we talk about fascinating characters or enemies that we happen to cross. Cody, I'll let you go first. All right, well, I'm going to give a shout out to the Hyrule Castle Town Infrastructure Minister. (laughs) (laughs) The minister, right? The minister. Yeah, Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't me. Slurring my words, that that was intentional. Intentional. That's not the minister. This minister. is the minister. Yeah. Um, because you know, that really made my day just wandering around the town and being like like these people understand sidewalks it better than <laughs> towns in, in <laughs> Texas. Texas. <laughs> yeah. Uh you know, these, not not hard, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. You know, these people make it accessible um for the main street for all kinds of people. Um so you know, just whoever's doing that. Um, I don't know if it's Princess Zelda who, I don't, I don't know if Princess Zelda's old enough in this particular game to have taken on affairs of state, but uh, <laughs> but somebody's doing it, uh, and congratulations to them for their great work um, in the in- infrastructure for Hyrule. Yep, yep, definitely got to recognize greatness. Uh, it seems like a very well thought out system, so good call there, Cody. Matt, how about you? Um, I'm going to go with... Hmm. I'm going to go with uh, Malari because he's just a really cool dude. I love his uh, mountain Minish clan. I love how distinct they are from the woodland Minish. I love how he's drawn very differently from the woodland he's Minish elder. Cool mustache thing. Yeah. Right? He, he's, yeah. yeah he, I, I really like how distinctive he looks. Um, his mannerisms are a little bit more gruff than the woodland minish. Like they feel like a distinctive tribe and, uh, it's really good art and character direction that, uh, that is coming to the forefront here through that character. Cool. Yep. Totally agree. Um, good call on Malari. That was my second pick for the week. Uh, my Z targeting this week is going to go to swift blade who uh, takes his craft very seriously and is a, a very fun little character who teaches you combat abilities. Um, Swiftblade gets the award for me this week uh, 
mainly he's a cool guy. <laughs> mainly for the reason that in order to demonstrate the techniques that he's teaching you, uh, he actually possesses your body. <laughs> yes, <laughs> performs he, like, it for he you. He possesses your mind. He's like, wow, <laughs> yeah. So um, he, he he does anime pose, and then he's like, "This is happening." And I'm like, "I don't know that I consented to this, Swift Blade." But like, <laughs> this this feels like a gross violation of my bodily autonomy right now. But uh, but thanks for the spin attack. Like, yeah. Um, cool looking guy you know I'm yeah just, no super cool all i'm saying is just tell me how to do it and then let, let like let me take a swing at it you know you don't you don't need to possess me physically like <laughs> it's okay <laughs> chill out guy yeah i mean look i like the running joke in video games where characters acknowledge that you're playing the game where they're like try pressing the a button or that kind of thing but he just skips the whole process and, and is like <laughs> no let me show you let by me, forcing you to do it let me just take control of your character <laughs> it's like, all right, all right well, yeah, he he's basically can create cutscenes. Yeah. And it's like, now that I know that he does that, I'm down for it. But you got to warn a guy first, you know, just give me a heads up, Swiftblade. Uh, don't think you're a bad guy. Just really your your technique could use some adjustment here. Um, but anyway. All right. That brings us uh, to part six, which is our final thoughts where we let Matt wrap up this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can think to do. So we continue our journey through the land of Hyrule, both tiny and normal sized, uh, by exploring a little more of uh, the realm in general, uh, revisiting Castletown, getting a tasty look at all the things that we're going to get to explore as we continue through the game, uh, we move on to this. Uh, <laughs> you said tasty. It reminds me, I completely forgot to talk about the shop that just sells pastries, <laughs> which, which look really tasty. Honestly, they look good. It's a useful shop. <laughs> it's definitely a useful shop. Uh, we explore this game's version of the mountainous region. Uh, it's probably soon to be renamed Death Mountain when some people get crushed by rocks while exploring. Uh, and then we get to meet the Mountain Minish tribe uh, who are going to helpfully uh, reforge the Picori sword for us and uh, get to experience this game's version of the fire dungeon which is a fun enough dungeon uh, that's got some interesting puzzles but isn't overly complex culminating in a boss fight that is uh, pretty pretty fine it's it's okay it's not great it's not bad uh, just is what it is uh, we got our get our second element and move on to our next week's worth of game and continue exploring this version of Hyrule well done, as always, Matt. You know, most weeks this would be the end of the Sacred Realms rundown. But guess <laughs> what, y'all? <laughs> Cody Davies is here. And look, I, usually we're doing this from opposite sides of the planet, and I can't see the meaningful raising of the eyebrows that he does when he's getting ready for his version of the Sacred Realms rundown, but I saw it just now. I was like, oh, Cody's got something. Cody's ready. All right, so uh, welcome, everyone, to part eight of the Sacred Realms rundown. Um, this is Australia facts. So, um, Australia has a population of around 25 million people. Okay. Okay. Which, which is enough. smaller than the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. that tracks, that tracks. Um, but larger than the state of Florida. So if it was a state, if it was a U.S. state, it would be the third most populous uh, U.S. state. Well, it's funny because usually when people make comparisons to Texas, they're talking about just sheer land size, right? Well, and, and that's one area where I believe Australia actually does have us beat, right? Australia as a continent is quite a bit larger than the state of Texas. Um, but, you know, I, I know a lot of that is um, wilderness, essentially. So I'm sure that's where the population disparity yeah. kind of comes into play. No, you're, you're, you're cutting into my America facts. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, no. I did stop okay. cutting into his to, America facts. I need to hang back in the cut right now. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, keep that in mind uh, for later. <laughs> um, part nine. Uh, Matt, do you intentionally mispronounce a whiskey each season of the pod? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, at this point, I just have to feed the ha the hungry masses of people who want to correct my phonetics. So, yeah. yeah. So this is just a chance for me to complain, um, actually, about um, so the the dinol dinol first mm -hmm. or the dinner floss, as you call uh, them here on mm -hmm. on the Sacred Realms podcast. Um, I, the, saw, I saw this discussion on the Discord the other day. Yeah. This is, I mean, you can pronounce it how you like, but you're you're mixing the L and the F in the wrong order. Like you keep saying dinner floss. <laughs> and so. Uh, Dinolfos? Yeah. Dinolfos? Okay. Dinolfos. Um, because, yeah, or Dinolfos, because they're dinosaurs. Um, and they're, but they're like Stalfos. 
Yeah. Or Lizalfos. Oh, Lizalfos. Lizalfos, yeah. And we're saying it didn't flow. Okay, gotcha. Yep, yep, you're right. You're correct. You're correct. You showed up with true facts. Hey, uh, just as an extension to this whole pronunciation thing, Matt, uh, I think your intentional mispronunciation next up should be uh, Bruklotic. Bruklotic. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm not even going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole, man. Yeah. You need to really break that down and just butcher it. To <laughs> and then Mark can write in and let you know why you said it wrong. I mean, oh, yeah. That's fair. Because yeah. he's Scotch and he knows. Well, when you switch Scottish. From- Is Scotch not a... No. He's Scottish. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Cody, continue. Yes. Okay. Uh, hold on. I lost my train of thought. Uh, Understandable. I'm really sorry. Well, yeah. whenever you switch from whiskey to, you know, the champagne. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I do know how to say that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, so part 11 America facts. Um, so Texas has a population of around 30 million, similar to Australia, but uh, it only is 270,000 square miles as opposed to the 3 million square miles of Australia, which wow. is approximately the same as the continental United States. So um, the U.S. is closer to four all up because Alaska is like half a country again. But right, the, yeah. Alaska's <laughs> huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the actual just, you know, contiguous United States is um, – is fairly similar in landmass to Australia, but the difference is Australia's got five to ten cities, and the rest of it is desert. Um, yeah. So, well, and those five to ten major cities are mostly coastal, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think they're all they're all basically coastal. All of the all of the ones that have a you know a large population. Is there infrastructure in Australia to where if you wanted to drive? basically straight across the continent, you can do that? Or do you have to kind of go? You have to follow the major roads. There's not there's there's not roads that really just cut directly through the wilderness in a straight line mm-hmm. um, when you're getting out into the real rural areas. You sort of have to follow the follow the highways that have been built. Gotcha. Okay. Um, cool. But, yeah, that was my Australia and America facts. Um this time, part 12, wow, the water dragon in Skyward Sword doesn't know what she's doing. Never knows. Just a general fact just that a, has to be repeated. Just a fact that, that people need to know. Um, and so, yeah, I will I will finish up with part 17, visit ZeldaUniverse.net and ZeldaMaps.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a fun time. And if you'd like to volunteer for Zelda Universe, we're always looking for people. Um, to help out, whether it's media stuff or writing news and uh, original opinion pieces, and uh, or doing guides mm-hmm. and walkthroughs, we're we're always looking for people. Yeah, I heard that uh, Matt was actually recently reached out to as uh, somebody who. You know, well, might, might I'm, be up for look, that kind of I'm thing. I'm known as an opinionated person. Uh, oh, no, you know <laughs> shit. I, yes, I've been told that that is, I've been told that I have that quality. Uh, so I was asked if I would be willing to write an opinion piece. I mean. To which I said yes. So. You know, like even at like the New York Times, that's the primary qualification for an opinion columnist. Yeah, <laughs> be an opinion. Have an opinion. Like, yeah, I can do that. Is have really strong opinions that annoy a bunch of people. Yeah, I can do that. Believe me. Yeah, and uh, famously quoted accurately as saying Skyward Sword is the best video game of all time. <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah, you're going to be like the. Uh, you're going to be the the New York Times columnist of Zelda Universe, I guess. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get everyone real riled up with my opinions. I'm on looking things. at a map of Australia right now, and it literally is just a bunch of cities that are along along like the south, uh, you know, kind of southeast coast, right? And then in the very smack dab middle of the whole continent, you've got Alice Springs, which right, which is population like ten thousand. It's not really a, a okay. city in the same way, but it is sort of the most notable place in in the central australia region what kind of hell do you have to go through to actually get to alice springs because it looks like it looks like some kind of quest must be required (laughs) yeah i mean look you you should be able to take a highway from like adelaide south australia up or from darwin at the top down okay 
Or most people just fly. So you don't have to actually do a walkabout to get to Alice Springs. <laughs> no, I mean, people have walked across the country, um, <laughs> but it is not... But that's the kind of thing people do if they want to get a Guinness World Record, not the kind of thing people do as a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as an ordinary everyday hobby. They really prepare for that one, huh? Yeah, yeah. fair enough. While 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 undertaking your Guinness Book of World Records walk across the continent, you can also get a really good look at the Guinness Book of World Records sized spiders and snakes and mm. all the yeah the terrifying things that Australia things that has want to, to kill offer. you in Australia. Yeah, emus, 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 yeah. very dangerous. Oh, yeah. very dangerous. We mm-hmm. lost a war against them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there is there a monument to the Great Emu War anywhere in oh, Australia? Probably somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's hilarious. Great. All right, never fails to amuse. Well, this is the real end of the Sacred Realms rundown, Cody. It's absolutely always a pleasure when you when you come on because uh, man, yeah, this is this is comedy gold, and I just don't know that we could do it better if we tried. Um, this has been a really fun episode. Honestly, it's great getting to do this in person. I'm glad that it lined up uh, to where that you know where we could make that happen. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Um well, ye goodbye dee, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you learned that in San Antonio. I'm not sure if that checks out. I don't think so. That yeah. one doesn't that one doesn't uh that one doesn't cross all the all the It doesn't gonna, it doesn't pass done. the Texas test. Yeah, we're going to go with that. You got to run additional tests. I had I had something I was saying I lost it. We're just going to go with that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, regardless, I know, Cody, you said you're here for another like four weeks, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I'm sure we're going to be seeing you again before you leave for nothing specifically at all. Nothing in particular. Not oh, doing yeah. anything neat. Oh, no, no. Nothing happening. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Merry Christmas, by the way. I assume by the time this gets released. Yes, this will be a yep. couple days after Christmas. Yes, correct. it will. Yes. It oh, will. We, should, we should say something, shouldn't we? Um... Yeah, it's it's the holiday season and uh, whether you celebrate Christmas or some other holiday that happens around this time, uh, there's lots of them. I don't even know all of them, but uh, we we wish that you have a very happy holiday season uh, with friends, family or just yourself. Uh, however, your life situation is shaking out. We we are very grateful for you uh, who are listening and we hope that you are happy and uh, healthy and well fed. Yep. Uh, about this time of year, I think people are really taking stock of the things that they're grateful for. And um, at least that's kind of the the way that I like to approach the holiday season. And one of the things that Matt and I are incredibly grateful for is this podcast and the community that's built up around it. Um, just what it's become um, is something that still amazes us and something that we're very proud of and something that our lives would be really different right now if we hadn't undertaken. Um, for instance, we would never be sitting across you know, this table from Cody Davies of Australia, the Barack Obama of Australia. The Secret <laughs> Service didn't even come with him. Like he just he walked into this house like it was no big deal. I know the snipers are up in the trees somewhere, but they're <laughs> they're letting us have our evening and I appreciate them for that. Um, but anyway, lots of lots of opportunities that just never never would have cropped up if we hadn't done this. And it has truly been the greatest gift. Um, so to you, our listeners, uh, thank you so much. We, we appreciate you listening to this show. We hope that it's been a great holiday season for you. Um, and you know, especially to all of the people who are in our discord community, um, we truly do consider y'all friends at this point. Like we really appreciate all of you such a wonderful community. And like all of you, you know who you are. Um, Honestly, like just I can't imagine a world where we didn't spin that whole thing up because uh, even like the podcast without the discord crew now just sounds crazy to me. It sounds sounds lifeless. Yep, in it, some just, ways. it just would not have been the same. So anyway, uh, lots and lots of things to be thankful for. But yeah, be safe, be healthy. And uh, yeah, next episode after this is going to be catching you in the new year. So hope that that's a great one. Hope it's a, a wonderful 2024. Um, a few things are happening next year that are giving me great anxiety about the general state of the world but uh that's next year's problem right now it's <laughs> still- <laughs> as we crack there's a meme that's going around it's will ferrell cracking open a beer i think from talladega nights <laughs> he's going and it says that's a 2024 problem so yeah that's lots how of I feel things about a lot are of things. lots of things are but right now it's still 2023 and the good times are a rolling all right y'all let's go ahead and close out this episode of the show get out of here for the week if you enjoyed today's episode and would like a little extra sacred realms in your life you can head over to patreon.com slash sacred realms pod and become a patron if you've got no rupees it's not a problem
problem. Five star Apple podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show. That makes us very happy. Hi, Leans. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sacred Realms Pod for updates on the podcast and for behind the scenes action. Sacred Realms will be back next Wednesday with our thoughts on the Minish Cap Chapter 3. We'd love for you to play along with us and to share your thoughts on our social channels. The Minish Cap can be played in its original form on the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Um, The exact same version of the game can be played digitally uh, on a variety of services, most of them now uh, no longer available. If you got it on the virtual console, the Wii U, you can play it there. If you got it through the 3DS Ambassador program, then you can play it there. Um, The way that I'm sure most of you are playing it is via the Nintendo Switch online service. Uh, where it is available uh, at the premium tier, as we were mentioning earlier. Um, And, of course, you can always emulate the game via a variety of services, but we ask that you not do that unless you legally own the version of the game that you're emulating. But in the meantime, may your hearts be full, may your arrows never miss. We'll catch you all. Sacred Realms is an independent, listener-supported podcast, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Business operations are handled by Matt Willoughby. Our music is generously provided by Darknuck and is available to listen to on Spotify. Finally, we'd like to thank Nintendo for continuing to create such exceptional and innovative experiences.